Randy Morgensen was an experienced backcountry ranger, having worked 28 seasons in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. He was intimately familiar with the High Sierra Wilderness, having explored it more than any other ranger. Dedicated to his job, Randy took his responsibilities seriously. On a summer day in 1996, Randy left a note on his tent, stating that he would be away for two or three days. Strangely, the date on the note was June 21st, not July 21st. Carrying only his backpack, he departed from near Bench Lake, leaving behind his Smith and Wesson 357 Magnum at camp. Unfortunately, Randy never returned, and he was never seen alive again. Randy Morgensen was one of many seasonal rangers who had been reapplying for their jobs every summer, with no medical benefits or retirement plan. They were a tight-knit group, referred to as the 14ers, as they had been returning to the park for over a decade, some even for two decades. Their reward was not monetary, but rather the beauty of the sunsets they witnessed. If a ranger were to die in service, their family would receive a one-time payment of $100,000, but no pension. Randy had written in his 1973 McClure Meadow Log, expressing his longing for adventure and the freedom to find his own path. Randy's life took a downturn as the 1996 season approached. His wife, Judy, decided not to join him on backcountry adventures after he had an affair with a fellow ranger named Lolinus. Randy's spirits were low, and he questioned the worth of his job after years of service. The divorce papers from Judy arrived, adding to his emotional burden. Randy's friends noticed his mood decline, and he confided in them about his thoughts of S. Then, on July 20th, 1996, he contacted his colleague and his wife on the radio, asking trivial questions. Their conversation abruptly ended with Randy stating, I won't be bothering you two anymore. The next day, Randy left his camp without a trace. The community was haunted by the mystery of Randy's disappearance. The circumstances left many questions unanswered. Was it an accident, foul play, or something more inexplicable, like an encounter with aliens? The search and rescue efforts were relentless, with rangers scouring the area for any sign of Randy. The search leader utilized a computer program called Cassie Computer Aided Search Information Exchange to track the effectiveness of each segment searched. However, weeks passed with no leads and morale began to decline. The rangers were determined to find their beloved colleague before it was too late. Ranger Rick Sancher, a second year backcountry ranger, hiked through the night to Randy's duty station at Bench Lake. There, he discovered a note confirming Randy's overdue status from a cross-country patrol. Anxiety grew as everyone wondered what had happened to their veteran mentor. The investigation into Randy's disappearance uncovered two separate threats of violence made against him. However, neither person had an alibi for the time of Randy's disappearance, leaving the case without a clear suspect. Speculation ran rampant. After 13 days of searching, hope started to dwindle. Then, in a remote gorge, five years later, a worker stumbled upon fresh evidence. It was a breakthrough. Rangers were summoned, and they discovered Randy's shirt bearing his badge, his backpack, and a boot half submerged in water. Excitement turned to horror when a leg bone was found in the boot. The evidence matched Randy's reported gear. Despite the discovery, the search for answers continued. Retired Sierra Sub-District Ranger Alden Nash believed that Randy had stumbled through a fragile snow bridge and fallen into an icy abyss, breaking his leg. He theorized that Randy's body remained hidden beneath the snow for days while search parties combed the area. Judy Morgensen received a letter after Randy's disappearance, but it arrived two days later. This added confusion to the mystery. The search for Randy yielded no definitive answers, leaving his family and colleagues yearning for closure. Randy Morgensen's fate remains a haunting mystery. Speculation and theories abound, but the truth eludes everyone. Despite the passage of time, the unanswered questions surrounding Randy's disappearance linger, forever reminding us of his enigmatic vanishing.
I was walking my dog last summer because we'd been driving all day and I wanted my husky to get some energy out before we went home. It was summer in Alaska, so it's not like it was particularly dark. But midnight here is more like twilight. We were going off the main trail that laps around the lake because it was a late, and while she was off leash doing her thing, I wanted to be on a clear path just in case. There's quite a few homeless camps tucked in the back of the park, but none around the trail, so I assume we'll be fine. There's one part of the trail that's a little more claustrophobic if you're a woman walking alone at night, so I jogged through it to get it over faster. I haven't seen my dog in a while. I don't hear collar jingling or leaves rustling. I assume she lost track of me because I changed my pace. I call out to her. Out of the silence, I hear a yelp. I panic. She must be hurt. I assume the worst and I head back toward the small trail to go find my baby. I get ten feet in and she finally runs up to me, super upset and missing her collar. She's a Malamute, my dudes. I can't get her collar off when I'm trying without pushing piles of fur out of the way. I'm not saying someone messed with my dog, but that collar didn't get caught and fall off on its own. I was at the summit of a local mountain when it hit me. I couldn't get back down before dark and I had no light. After climbing back down to the hiking part of the trail, I began to jog. I was making good time when I went down hard, skinning my knee and shin. I got back up in some degree of shock and started again. I finally got to a point in the trail where I realized I would make it out by twilight, so I stopped to give my bloody leg some first aid. After washing the injury and treating it with an antiseptic, I got ready to bandage it. On the other side of a row of willows, maybe ten feet away, I heard and saw a huge mountain lion quietly slithering their way back up the mountain. While I was tending my wound, the area was totally silent. That sumbitch must have been watching me for a good five minutes. I can still recall the hair on the back of my neck sticking up and the weird adrenaline taste in my mouth. I haven't hiked without a firearm since. Since I was a child, I knew something about this universe and understood it in a way that I could not explain to others. The one who visits me doesn't speak and everything this organism has shown me has made me feel not at odds with mankind. This place is an illusion and it was created in a way by the place they come from. It's done so scientifically and they observe us as energy, frequency and vibration sort of left to its demise. Time for them is different from what we consider time. When I'm there, I've watched half a million years of evolution here and about a year's worth of what we call time. Our universe is held together by these beautiful rods that keep it stable. This alien has explained that everything is a copy of a copy, that their universe was made, and they are also watched. I know better than to tell therapists or people what I know I've experienced. At one visit, I was able to see how they had created our universe, and it reminded me a lot of what we have as the Large Hadron Collider. Unknown to us, and it will remain unknown for many lifetimes, we never die. Our energy comes back here is that we will also recognize that we have the knowledge to create the universe. But I never get to know if we just observe as they do. They have watched us evolve over millions of years, which to them has been 14, 17 years as far as I can understand. There are gateways here, on Earth, but they are often found and then closed. The area I was shown was South America, which had the most prevalent doors. I know I am not separate from anything in this universe, and that they have a different time understanding why we act and do the things we do. To them, it's senseless and almost an embarrassment because they know what we are truly capable of doing. As a 42-year-old female, I don't age, and I don't put effort into not aging. I know the two who came for me gave me this gift, and I know why. I live my life very carefully and have dedicated my time to quantum physics, astrophysics, and healing for mankind. It's all I'm capable of doing as myself at the moment. 
I'm not the only one. There are a lot of us. We tend to be tall and thin and people are attracted to us by our energy. My blood type is O negative and I descended from them when a few passed through the gates and didn't go back. I wish I had more time to explain things and the beauty in all of life, but I don't. Not here, not now. I'm not crazy. I am not traumatized by them or their visits or my visits. If I could emphasize one thing, it would be that right now we are in an interesting place to make changes and see truths we weren't taught to see. Here it's a thousand years at most, there a day or two. They do not influence us, but more so pity us because we are capable of doing so much more in our moment. We don't have the ability to see what is real. It is kept from us for a small number of individuals' greedy interests. Even those small percentages cannot see through the illusion that they created. I'm only one person here. There I'm everything and everyone, so there is no lie to be sold. They are not very forthcoming about what or where I get to go once my energy fades elsewhere. But I do believe in the next phase they will be with me and guide me as in this one. This story dates back to 2009 when I was 45 years old and living in a home I owned in Boca Raton, Florida. I am an educated business professional who enjoys reading about paranormal things, but never really had any encounter to speak of. It was early in the afternoon, and I had a friend over who was helping out with some electrical work on the second floor. I walked away for a moment down the hall when all of a sudden I heard a voice whisper directly in my ear you're going to be arrested. I immediately felt weak to my knees and nauseous and got slightly dizzy. It felt as if something or some energy field had traversed right through me. I swear it sounded as if a person had leaned over and spoken right into my ear. But of course, no one was there. I had no idea what to make of the message or the experience. I sat in my downstairs office, bewildered by what just occurred. I started to nervously fidget with things and picked up an old ski mask I had lying there. I don't know why, but I shoved a white paper plate into it, drew rather angry eyes in its sockets, and leaned it upright against the wall on my desk, staring at it, but not aware of a reason why I did that. My friend came downstairs, but I didn't mention anything about what had just happened. Frankly, I wouldn't have known how to relate it. Two days later, at about 6 a.m., my doorbell rang. A short young man stood there and said he crashed into my garbage cans, and if I got a hefty bag, he'd clean it up. I was half asleep, not cognizant of how weird this was, and made my way to the garage. I hit the door opener button, the door started to rise, and then I was bum-rushed by a dozen camouflaged men pointing M16 machine guns at me. I was tackled to the ground, handcuffed, and dragged out front. Now wouldn't you know it, all of these guys had on ski masks. In fact, there were about 50 officers from the DEA, FBI, and Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, all of them masked. It turned out that a particular individual whom I rented a house in another town had been caught making drugs there, and that lowlife told the cops it was my operation, just to save his own skin. They came to my house thinking they were going to find Pablo Escobar or a Walter White type. I wound up spending a night in jail before anyone could get me out and sort out the mess. All charges were dropped, of course, but I think some angel or otherworldly being saw this coming and tried to warn me. Because I didn't have any clue as to what was going on at my rental property, and there certainly was nothing going on in my own life to validate a fear of arrest. Some entity knew it was coming and more or less just told me so. It didn't really help in any way. I will never forget that voice, although it was no one I could recognize. When I was a very young child, like six or seven, I wandered off from my parents at a picnic in the Australian bush. The thing you need to understand about the Australian bush is that the forests are really dense and really messy, making it extremely difficult to move through. 
Not even mentioning the fact that basically every animals you come across will kill you. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was really common for kids to go missing in the bush and never be found again because it was ridiculously hard to search the bush and extremely easy to be killed. Well, by some miracle, after seven hours of searching with police and the local town, I was found completely unharmed. But the whole ordeal was really scarring for young me, and to this day I still can get anxious when thinking about that day. The Australian bush is just something else. I watched in boredom as yet another drop of sweat ran down my forehead and landed with a splash onto my rifle. This was my first time holding a gun, and I hadn't anticipated how heavy it would be. I looked over to my colleague who, in the blistering midday sun, frantically applied sunscreen to his pale English skin. Glancing down, I scanned the forest floor below the dense jungle canopy fixing my gaze on the large chunk of elephant meat we had placed as bait. We had been sitting up in that contraption for hours by that point, waiting. I believe it's called a tree stand, but by its size it might as well have been a small watchtower. In case you're unfamiliar, a tree stand is a small platform that hunters attach to trees in order to gain a high vantage point over their hunting ground. The tree stand we were waiting in consisted of a fairly large rectangular platform with metallic rails running around its edges. How these grunts managed to install this thing all the way up here is beyond me. Damn mosquitoes, Dr. Burnsby, my boss, blurted out under his breath as he squashed the bug under the palm of his hand. I already knew he wasn't cut out for this environment. Burnsby was a veterinarian based out of Oxford. He specialized in the treatment of exotic animals, specifically reptilian and avian species. Though, I quickly came to realize that his specialization came strictly from within the comforts of a lab or a clinic, and not from the actual field. I was, at the time, a 25-year-old grad student, and had been working part-time as Dr. Fernsby's research assistant for a few months before he requested I accompany him on this expedition. Even prior to meeting him for the first time back in January, I was already familiar with his work. He was a talented veterinarian and a proficient animal consultant to a number of wildlife preserves and zoos worldwide. It came to me as no surprise when I heard how adamant our employer had been that Dr. Fernsby be on board with the project. The doctor was the best at what he did. With a series of sudden and loud metallic thuds, my eyes quickly darted over to the large container fastened on the back of the flatbed truck that had arrived with us. It started shaking, violently bobbing from side to side with each thud as if something within was trying to break free. The only things that kept the crate in its place were two sets of yellow ratchet straps, which seemed to loosen ever so slightly with each bang. The fact that the container hadn't fallen off during the treacherous ride over was a miracle in itself. Then two men dressed in camo pattern tank tops and cargo pants promptly exited the vehicle and made their way toward the shaking container. They each had something long and black in their hands, but from the distance they were at, it was hard to make out details. What do you think they have in there? King Kong? I asked Dr. Burnsby, trying to make light conversation. We hadn't spoken to each other a lot these past three hours. Huh? He replied confused, cocking his head to look at me. It seemed as if I had broken him from some sort of trance. In there, that container. I said, pointing toward the truck. Oh, he said, I don't know. I looked to my side at the other man up in the tree stand with us. A big game hunter from South Africa named Arno. I didn't know much about him, except that he had a reputation of frequently hunting large endangered mammals like elephants, giraffes, rhinos, and even lions on some occasions. All for sport. From the moment I met Arno, I could tell Dr. Fernsby took a dislike to him, and so did I. Arno sat completely still, looking through the scope of his rifle, unfazed by the extreme heat and excess of insects. 
I wondered whose genius idea it was to pair a couple of veterinarians with a trophy hunter. Then, a loud humming, like that from an engine, gradually grew louder and louder. I figured I would soon get the answer to my question. I looked back over to the two men in tank tops beneath us. They had now climbed onto the back of the truck. They each unlocked a series of hatches on the container and inserted the black object through one of the various openings. A chorus of loud crackling sounds emanated from the container, along with rapid flashes of blue light. For a moment, the thuds from within became more aggressive than ever, almost knocking one of the men over. But as the crackling continued, the container gradually calmed down. The thudding died out, and peace had once again returned to the jungle. The low hum of the approaching engine also came to a stop, and the sound of a car door opening and closing could be heard below. It had been very clear from the start that these guys weren't involved with any kind of wildlife preservation group, as they had said they were when they first reached out to us. When masked men wielding assault rifles greeted us at the runway immediately after stepping off the plane, I knew Dr. Fernsby had made a serious lapse of judgment in coming here. Though, the fact remained, they hadn't hurt us nor treated us badly. Not yet anyway. If anything, they were quite accommodating. These men were surprisingly well-spoken and mannered, despite their frightening appearances. The platform started shaking as someone had begun making their way up the flimsy rope ladder. I looked down below me and saw a figure rapidly ascending. Apologies for the wait, gentlemen. The man panted as he had reached the top of the ladder. He stretched out his hand and introduced himself as Mr. Adebio, our employer. He was a tall and handsome African man who, despite the intense heat of the jungle, wore a white three-piece designer suit. I am pleased to see my men were able to transport you here safely. I do hope you had a pleasant ride. The eccentric man said with a smile. I looked down at the deteriorated Humvee we arrived in and scoffed. Mr. Adebo's gaze shifted toward Arno. Specifically, his rifle. Arno took notice. Don't worry, Carfentano. Arno said reassuringly in a thick South African accent. Confused, Mr. Adebo raised his eyebrows. Tranquilizer. Arno added removing a cylindrical dart filled with clear liquid from his vest and holding it up. Good. Mr. Debo replied. And those? He gestured toward the munitions belt tied around his shoulder. It was filled with all kinds of bullets, from low caliber to high, and everything in between. Plan B, Arno said. Mr. Debo pointed over to me and nodded toward my rifle. And what about him? He asked. Tranquilizer as well, sir. Arno replied. Gave it to him this morning. Pleased with the answer, Mr. Debo stepped back and smiled. I can't stress enough how important it is that we bring it in alive, gentlemen. Unharmed. That is why you two are here. Adebo said and pointed to Dr. Fernsby and I. If anything should go wrong, I trust your expertise within this field should come in handy, Doctor. A brooding and quizzical grimace formed across Fernsby's face. And exactly what are we supposed to be bringing in here? He inquired. Lions? Bigfoot? Adebio chuckled. Oh, I can't do it justice by describing it, Doctor. You have to see it with your own eyes. Besides, I wouldn't want to spoil all the fun. You might not dare to stay the night otherwise. Adebo said with a smirk. Don't you think it's important that we know what we're looking for? Arno questioned with a hint of irritation in his voice. I could tell he wasn't one to play games. Oh, trust me, you will know when you see it. Adebo once again vaguely replied. He took a step forward and continued. Livestock found killed a village in ruins, and four people reported missing. This is not a creature from our world, I can assure you of that. I exchanged concerned looks with Dr. Burnsby. Without saying a word, I could tell that he only had one thing on his mind. This guy is crazy. Now, any more questions? Adebio asked. Yet again, 
A loud metallic thud filled the air and sounded throughout the jungle, and I could hear the men in tank tops shouting at each other. What's in that cage? I asked, pointing down at the container on the truck below. Call it. Plan B. Adebo smirked and winked at Arno before he turned around and walked toward the ladder. It will be night soon. I expect all will be revealed sooner rather than later. And with that, Mr. Adebo climbed down the ladder, got in his jeep, and drove off through the dense vegetation until only the humming of his engine could be heard. And then, that too faded away. The three of us looked at each other perplexed, though we didn't say a word. Arno got back into position and resumed scanning the jungle for movement. As long as I'm still getting paid, he sighed. As time progressed, the shadows drew longer, and the beautiful orange hue dyed the evening sky. Yet, there was still no sign of whatever animal we were looking for. The chunk of elephant meat we had placed out hours ago had started decomposing, and a foul stench radiated throughout the rainforest. As far as I could tell, Arno hadn't moved at all during the past couple of hours. I almost refused to believe he was human. I looked down to the two men by the truck below us. They had set up a couple of hammocks in which they had fallen asleep an hour ago. Things seemed to quiet down in the jungle as well. Fewer birds were singing now, and I hadn't heard movement from within the cage in what felt like forever. As I sat in the evening sun, taking in the serene rainforest that surrounded me, a faint scratching sound came from directly behind me. Curious, I turned around and caught a shadowy glimpse of movement in the corner of my eye. I searched the nearby branches of the trees next to ours, but I saw nothing. Then the shadow appeared again from behind one of the branches of a tree no more than 15 meters away. Before I could get a closer look, it once again disappeared from view. Something was traversing the forest canopy at incredible speeds. Slightly alarmed, I stood up and walked to the back of the tree stand in order to get a closer look. Neither Fernsby nor Arno had cared enough to notice my commotion. The shadow moved again, leaping from one branch to another, and then disappearing once again. It was even closer this time. The low evening sun made it difficult to make out any details in the gloomy jungle. Then, a high-pitched screech filled my ears as I saw the shadow leap out from behind the tree and land on a branch just a few meters away. Fernsby had definitely heard it by now, and he turned around to see what was responsible for the awful noise. The creature growled, and in the dark shadows of the rainforest I could barely make out its features. It was sitting there, perched on a thick branch, holding something with both its arms, eating something. The animal was vaguely humanoid in appearance and covered in sleek black fur. Two bright specks of light reflected from the creature's large eyes. I inched closer to the metal rail on the edge of the platform in order to get a better look. Another shadow appeared on the tree to my right, and then another one on my left. Then another. The animal skittered across the canopy and drew closer to our tree stand. I felt a gust of hot air brush down the back of my neck, and I swiftly turned around to see a large dark face with grinning teeth staring directly at me. I'm ashamed to say the sight startled me so much that I nearly lost my balance and fell over the guard rails. Up close, there was no mistaking the identity of the creature. It was some species of monkey or ape. And up close, it was rather cute as well. Fernsby chuckled. Bonobo, he said with a smile. Probably juvenile, judging by its size. I stretched my hand out to pet it, but Arno protested. For the first time since Mr. Adebio had left us, Arno moved. He turned around and looked me dead in the eye. Don't touch it. They are a nasty and vicious sort. You're better off leaving it alone. He warned me as he rolled up his sleeve and showed off a thick line of scar tissue that ran down his forearm. You don't want to lose an arm, do ya? Though feeling that he was somewhat over-exaggerating the inherent danger, I still retracted my hand and took a step away from the innocent-looking ape. For a brief moment, the three of us all stood in the rapidly fading sunlight and stared curiously at the troop of apes. Dr. 
Fernsby watched in awe as the apes jumped around and played with each other. Fernsby had treated a couple of primates at the clinic back in Oxford, but seeing them thriving in their natural habitat must have given him a sense of childlike wonder he'd forgotten he had. Suddenly, one of the apes froze and tilted its head. Its large, dark eyes widened and it began uncontrollably screaming. Soon after, the others followed. They had gone crazy by the looks of it. Something had startled them. The primates scattered across the trees and as suddenly as they had appeared, they were now gone. At the same time, a flock of exotic birds cawed and began rapidly flapping their wings in unison, flying above the canopy, away from the forest. They too seemed to be fleeing from something. A wave of dread washed over me. The air felt thicker now and the atmosphere had taken on a more sinister tone. Behind me, I heard Arno curse quietly under his breath. And then he cursed loudly. What's the matter? Dr. Fernsby asked, but to no response. Arno picked up his rifle and frantically scanned the forest floor below. No, 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 he blurted out. I placed my hand on his shoulder and asked him what the problem was, but again, he paid no attention to it. Damn it, Arno, just talk to us. What's wrong? I shouted at him, greatly annoyed by this point. The meat, Arno finally said. Confused, I further inquired, meat? What are you talking about? The elephant meat, the bait we placed, he replied. What about it, doctor? Fernsby asked worriedly. Well, bloody look at it. It's gone. Night fell swiftly in the jungle, and a thick cloak of darkness had draped itself over the clearing we had been watching. The only light visible came from the faint rays of moonlight that occasionally shone through the jet-black overcast above. For the past twenty minutes Arno had been fumbling with one of the field radios he carried, trying to get into contact with the two sleeping mercenaries below us, but it was to no avail. Even if they were awake, I doubted we could get the radio working and get into contact with them. Whenever Arno tried broadcasting, only static interference could be heard coming from the other end. At one point, he even changed the channels in order to get into contact with Mr. Adebio. But the signal didn't seem to be strong enough, as he received nothing but static. Maybe it's due to those clouds, Dr. Fernsby theorized pointing up at the dark storm clouds that drifted closer by the minute. I can go down there, if you'd like. Wake them up. I offered, but Arno protested, saying it wasn't worth the risk. Hey, Arno abruptly shouted, breaking the calm silence of the forest. He waved his arms up and down and shouted again. Fernsby shushed him and tried to get him to calm down. You're scaring it away. Stop that, he warned Arno. Down below there was movement in the two hammocks. It worked. Shut up, Fernsby said again. You're scaring it, the animal, you're scaring it. Arno stopped once he noticed the two mercenaries were now awake and he had gotten their attention. He turned his head toward the doctor, or attracting it. He responded to Fernsby. The men in tank tops promptly rushed to their radios, but only the crackle of static could be heard. With a greatly over-exaggerated gesture, Arno pointed over to where the bait had laid. The men turned and now too noticed that it had disappeared. One of them raised his hand and gave us a thumbs up, while the other walked to the back of the flatbed truck and started unlocking the hatches on the container. What are they doing? Fernsby asked Arno, who just simply replied with, Plan B, I presume. The large metallic door of the cage swung open, and the other man walked over to assist. They each grabbed a large chain and started tugging, pulling whatever was attached to it out of the cage. Meanwhile, I noticed three large drops of water splashing down on the railing in front of me, followed by a loud rumbling and an additional two more drops. Down below, a deep growl could be heard as the two men had dragged whatever resided in the container out into the forest clearing. Attached to the chains walked a large, dark figure on all fours. Clearly the two men must have given it some form of anesthesia, otherwise the animal could easily escape from its confines. 
Instead, the sedated animal walked slowly and without rhythm. It looked as if it could fall over at any moment. Once the men had pulled the animal out into the middle of the clearing, they each took their chain and bolted it down into the ground on opposite sides, binding the animal in place. A ray of moonlight shone through the thick clouds above, and we could now see the creature clearly. The poor animal was a large silverback gorilla, grotesquely tied down by massive chains on the forest floor below us. It was being used as bait, live bait. I could see that Dr. Fernsby was furious. He turned to Arno and profusely yelled at him, but Arno shifted the blame. He didn't know what plan B entailed either. Though he wasn't directly responsible, I could see in his eyes that he had no remorse for the poor ape. He had probably hunted worse, done worse. The slow patter of raindrops on the triangular roof of the tree stand had started picking up its pace, and streams of water ran down its corners. The rain combined with the Inkai blackness of the jungle made it hard to see what was going on in the clearing. A loud wailing sound could be heard from the gorilla, and as the two men walked back to the truck, the animal let out a soft whimper. It was heartbreaking, but there was nothing I could do. Not from up here, not with these men, and not in this rain. The mercenaries proceeded to climb inside the front seats of the truck to seek shelter from the rain. Can you see anything? I asked Fernsby, who promptly replied with a firm no. The storm picked up, and seeing through the thick wall of the torrential rain proved impossible. Besides from the heavy splashing of downpour, the only sound that could be heard in the jungle was the cries from the chained-up ape. Night vision goggles, bottom compartment. Arno said and tossed a damp canvas bag over to me. Give me a pair as well. The jungle lit up in a bright green fluorescent light as I put the goggles over my head. An electronic whirring sound emanated from the device. Though the rain still made it hard to see, I was able to get a view of the whole clearing now. I could see the gorilla, sitting on the wet mud, tugging at its chains, trying to break free. It wailed through the rain. Then a familiar stench crept its way up my nostrils. The smell of decay. The same smell that just hours ago had polluted the fresh jungle air. I recognized it to be the scent of the decomposing elephant meat. But that was impossible. It had been gone for quite some time. However, now it was back, and it reeked stronger than before. I swiveled my head back and forth, scanning every tree and bush that surrounded the clearing. No signs of life, and no signs of the source of the smell. A deep rumble sounded throughout the rainforest, quickly followed by a flash of lightning. With the night vision goggles, it was almost blinding. I rubbed my eyes and then put it back on, continuing to scan beneath the canopy. Ever so slightly, the tree stand trembled. At first I thought nothing of it, until it shook again, harder this time. I asked Fernsby and Arno if they had felt it too, but they brushed it off as being the workings of the wind. Satisfied with the answer, I went back to keeping watch, until the foundation of the stand was yet again hit with a powerful vibration. A faint boom sounded, followed by the tree stand once more swaying back and forth. That didn't sound like thunder. I whispered to the doctor. The wailing of the gorilla filled my ears, and I focused my gaze on the poor primate. It seemed alarmed. The gorilla desperately tugged at its chains. The goggles whirred as I zoomed in on the animal. The ape was intently looking behind itself, over its shoulder. And then it looked up, toward the wall of dense green foliage. You see that? Arno asked, tapping me on my shoulder. I adjusted my goggles and looked in the direction he pointed me at. At the edge of the forest, slightly to the left behind the gorilla, the tree line swayed unnaturally fast compared to the rest of the surrounding plants. Tall palm trees and large bushes got pushed from side to side, and the dense greenery made loud cracking sounds as if a thousand twigs had snapped at once. Something big was moving through the underbrush. Jesus, what is that? I asked Arno, to no response, who quietly chambered a round into his rifle and motioned for me to do the same. Even with the deafening splattering of rain, 
I pulled the bolt on my rifle back as quietly and slowly as I could. Having noticed all the commotion, Dr. Fernsby inquired as to what was going on, but he was quickly shushed by the concentrated hunter. Another deep rumble sounded, and the tree stand once again shook violently, and then another, followed by yet another. Whatever it was was coming closer. With each vibration, large ripples formed on the puddles of mud down below, and the distressed gorilla, fueled by adrenaline, hopelessly pulled at its chains. What is going on? Please just talk to me, Dr. Fernsby demanded in a frustrated manner. For the last time, be quiet, Arno hissed at the doctor. The sound of a large branch snapping and half shot past the noise of the heavy downpour, and through the thick rainfall I could make out a large shadow slowly emerging from the vegetation, about seven meters above the gorilla. I zoomed in with my goggles to get a closer look at the shape. I think Arno did too, as I heard his goggles emit a low whir. There, high above in the tree line at the edge of the forest, right behind where the gorilla sat, an enormous scaly snout had emerged from the leaves. Attached to the long snout were a set of large, sharp serrated teeth. It almost resembled the snout of a crocodile, except this was way more rounded and broad in its design. The rest of the head was still concealed behind the dense foliage, making it impossible to get a better look at the rest of the creature. In the bright green of the night vision goggles, I could see vents of steam shoot out of the beast's nostrils as it exhaled. You ought to see this, doctor, I said, taking off my night vision goggles and passing them over to Fernsby. He put them on and searched around in the darkness for a while until he abruptly stopped and gasped. Even without the goggles, I could still make out the dark shape of the creature's snout poking out of the tree line just over a hundred meters away. Remarkable. Fernsby proclaimed, trying to zoom in with his goggles. A new species of megafauna, never before observed by the eyes of science. If we're lucky, we might get to name it, I jokingly said to him, trying to hide the nervous undertones in my voice. I could tell the doctor was awestruck, but I didn't quite share the same feeling. Sure, the creature didn't look like a threat from way over there, but that head was suspended high off the ground maybe high enough that it could reach the tree stand if it came over here. No, I didn't feel a sense of joy at this new discovery. I felt horror. Faster than the blink of an eye, the large beast came crashing down through the foliage and wrapped its twisted jaws around the torso of the poor gorilla. I witnessed in horror as I saw the ape being lifted high up in the air by the monster. The gorilla's chains snapped as the large beast shook its prey from side to side. It then put the great ape down on the ground and began tearing off large chunks of its flesh. Due to the dark, I thankfully couldn't make out all the gory details. I looked over to Arno, who had raised his rifle in preparation of shooting the large beast. However, I could see that he too was terrified. Below, I could hear the nauseating sounds of flesh ripping and bones cracking. Just from its dark silhouette, I could tell the beast was massive. It stood maybe six or seven meters tall, or around 20 feet for you Americans. It seemed to be mainly bipedal, although it alternated between using its massive forelimbs for support. The creature had a long and thick tail covered in scales, which it used for balancing itself. When it was done eating, it lifted its enormous head and sniffed in the air. Steam oozed out of its nostrils with each sniff. In the faint moonlight, I could see the reflective glistening of blood around its mouth. Had it caught on to our scent, it let out a deep snarl and took a few steps toward us. The ground shook each time one of the animal's powerful hind legs slammed into the ground. Give him the goggles, Arno whispered to Fernsby. He needs them to see what he's shooting. Fernsby handed over the goggles and once again, I quickly put them back on. In shades of nauseating green, I could see the monstrosity in way more detail now. A thick plumage of what looked like feathers covered its rigid back. My gaze shifted to the head of the creature. It had large reptilian eyes, like that of a snake, with small cartilaginous ridges rising above each eye socket, probably to shade them from sunlight during the day. 
Jesus Christ. What does a Debio even want with a freak of nature like that? Fernsby whispered. Power, I'm guessing. Arno replied. He is a warlord after all. There is no way he could ever get control over that thing, I shot in. Agreed. Then, to everyone's surprise, the headlight beams of the flatbed truck suddenly turned on and illuminated the right side of the animal. The large animal cocked its head and walked over to the vehicle in which the two mercenaries sat. No, 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 turn it off, turn it off, I heard Arno whisper under his breath, readying his rifle. Down below I could hear frantic shouting in a language I didn't understand. The beast lowered its head right besides the front door of the cabin and used one of its big eyes to peer in through the window. The shouting abruptly came to an end. The beast let out an ear-piercing roar, and in one fluid motion it swung its head and sank its sharp teeth into the metal exterior of the truck. It bit down and tore off the roof of the truck cabin. Arno and I raised our rifles and shot at the creature. It didn't even flinch. With my night vision goggles I could see the two men cowering in their seats. One of them unbuckled his seatbelt and exited the truck on the opposite side of the creature. The remaining man fumbled with his buckle, but couldn't get free. The creature cocked its head curiously to look at the trapped mercenary. I reloaded my rifle and took another shot at the beast. It had no effect. The creature came crashing down on the truck. The mercenary screamed as the animal ripped him from his seat and lifted him into the air. The screams came to a sudden stop as the beast raised back its head and swallowed the man whole. A loud shouting could be heard coming from the left side of the large animal. The other man stood out in the middle of the forest clearing. Mokul Mbemb, Mokul Mbemb, he shouted as he raised an assault rifle and took aim. Before the man could pull the trigger, the monster grabbed him with one of its forearms and raised him high over the ground. Arno took another shot. A loud crackle sounded, and a bright flash appeared around the man. The animal loosened its grip and the mercenary fell face down into the wet mud. He had used his stun baton to get free. The man crawled along the wet forest floor in an attempt to escape. The large reptile caught up to him and pressed one of its legs down onto the man's back, crushing him and leaving a massive three-toed footprint of blood and gore. It bent down to feast on what remained of the poor fellow. In unison, we both took yet another shot at the creature. This time it flinched and snapped its head toward the location of the tree stand. It bellowed in agony and began making its way to where we sat perched. Just as I was about to take another shot, my rifle jammed. I tilted it to the side to see that an empty cartridge had gotten itself stuck in between the chamber and the bolt, slightly poking out. In a panic I looked over to Arno, hoping he would know how to fix it. Pull the bolt back, damn it, he shouted. I did as he said, but it wouldn't nudge. I felt the ground tremble beneath me as the creature stood only a few meters away. In a panic, I dropped my rifle just as the powerful jaws of the animal bit down onto the platform. It shook its head from side to side in an attempt to detach the tree stand. I fell backwards on the floor, landing on my side. My night vision goggles slipped off my head and slid down off the platform, disappearing into the dark shrubbery below. The beast let go off the platform and instead walked to the side of the stand. It circled us for a while, snarling and growling while it was trying to figure out how to get to us. Then it stopped to our right. Somehow it had identified the support cables that held the tree stand in its place. It hissed and tore at them with its powerful claws until finally the sound of a taut metal cable going limp filled my ears with dread. Hold on to something. Dr. Fernsby shouted at the top of his lungs, just as the tree stand lost its balance and tipped over. I grabbed the metal railing and braced for impact, but it never came. We never hit the ground. The stand hung suspended at a 60-degree angle from one of the remaining support cables. Bags, boxes, and crates slid down the wet floor past me and fell down into the jungle below. The creature roared beneath me. It sounded like a chorus of rusty chairs being dragged across a concrete floor. 
I looked around to see that Dr. Fernsby held on to dear life by one of the rails on the opposite side of the platform, but there was no sign of Arno the hunter. Below I could see the open jaws of the animal snapping after my legs. I was just out of reach. Then, to my horror, the railing bent and bent until it finally snapped, sending me falling for what felt like an eternity. I hit the wet mud of the forest floor with a soft thud and saw that my colleague also lay beside me, unmoving and covered in dirt. Still no sign of Arno. I quickly rose to my feet and rushed over to help Fernsby when a large shadow cast itself on the ground beneath, ominously looming over us. I brushed mud and water out of my eyes to see the animal standing a short distance away, looking down at us. It cocked its head and I could see its raw muscles tensing in anticipation of leaping forwards. Then, someone's loud shouting filled the air. Arno stood in the middle of the clearing, holding his rifle. He waved one of his arms and continued shouting. He had managed to capture the creature's attention, and the large beast turned toward him. My ears rang as he shot at the creature. He wasn't using the tranquilizer darts anymore. The beast let out an agonizing roar and began running in his direction. Seeing my opportunity, I helped Fernsby get to his feet, and we made a run for the Humvee parked right beside the now-ravaged flatbed truck. Lucky for us, the keys were still in the ignition. I slammed my foot down at the gas pedal, and the tires began spinning, slinging mud in every direction before the vehicle finally started moving forward. Through the windshield I could see the massive beast standing in the middle of clearing, partially illuminated by the headlights of the truck. In the creature's mouth, Arno hung from his left arm, writhing in pain. A thick stream of blood ran down the arm and covered the hunter's body in a sickly shade of crimson red. The animal bit down and Arno fell to the ground. He clutched at his severed arm and cried out in pain. The animal's head then pummeled down, and the screaming finally stopped. I turned the car around and drove onto the dilapidated dirt road we had arrived on. Palm trees and jungle vines passed by as I floored the gas pedal. Behind, I could feel the ground trembling, and in the rear view mirror I could see the beast giving chase. It took long and powerful strides, swiftly and elegantly running on its hind legs. It reminded me of the way a large terrestrial bird would run, like an ostrich or an emu. The large carnivore had started gaining on us, quickly covering great distances with each step it took. And then it stopped. It just stood there in the middle of the road. Had it suddenly decided to give up? Just like that. In the rear view mirror, the creature gradually began shrinking. It let out a final bellowing roar before it disappeared into the thick jungle by the side of the road. The rubber windshield wipers desperately wiped away the pattering rain on the glass of the Humvee as I continued to speed down the muddy thoroughfare. As we rounded a sharp turn, my eyes were drawn to the dismantled jeep that laid upside down in a ditch on the side of the road. Its tires were ripped off. The tail lights blinked a bright red and large claw marks ran along its side. Since we were moving so fast, I didn't get the chance to properly investigate the scene. But as I sped past, I could have sworn I saw a white blazer covered in specks of crimson hanging from a branch on a nearby tree. It took us no more than two days to leave the country and fly back to England. We didn't bother trying to report our experience to the local authorities back in Congo. We didn't expect they would believe us anyway and we definitely didn't want to get into any trouble. We packed our bags and left with the first plane available. Dr. Fernsby is still a little shaken up after the traumatic incident, but he is mostly fine. This all happened a few years ago, but I felt it was important we finally share what happened to us that fateful day in the humid jungles of the Congo Basin. As of late, I've seen news articles online detailing discoveries of ravaged towns in the Congolese countryside. The few remaining survivors blamed the disaster on an entity they call Mokal Mbem. When I first read it, I knew I had heard the name from somewhere before, and then chills shivered down my spine as I recalled the last words of the brave mercenary. In his final moments, he had called the beast Mokal Mbem as well. 
I've done some research and have come to find Mokul Mbem describing a large quadrupedal animal or water spirit that resides in lakes and rivers. Mokul Mbem is described as an herbivorous reptile possessing a long neck, like that of a sauropod dinosaur. Some people believe Mokul Mbem is living proof that Mesozoic-era dinosaurs survived into the modern world, previously thought to have gone extinct around 65 million years ago. However, the description of Mokul Mbem does not match the beast I encountered that night many years ago. The creature I encountered certainly didn't have an abnormally long neck, and it for sure wasn't herbivorous. This begs the question, are there more of them out there? Different species? Is there an undiscovered ecosystem thriving in the deep recesses of the Congo Basin, waiting to be discovered? According to the Congolese government, around 80% of the jungle around the northeastern part of the country remains uncharted. Who knows what mysteries are left to unfold? What wonders, secrets, and horrors are left to be observed under the watchful eyes of scientists? I've made attempts to contact Dr. Fernsby, but I have as of this moment not received any response. I'm using my university to try and raise funding for this next expedition, and so far the council seems to be on board with the idea. Of course, I haven't told them everything, not yet anyway. Ever since that night, I have had an obsessive compulsion to return to the jungle. The lull of adventure and discovery is calling upon me. I have to go back. I have to know if something has survived. It was the summer of June 2013, and the high temperatures were not helping farmers. Even though it wasn't a dry year in the state, a few weeks had been a little hotter than usual. I lived in Altamont, Missouri. When some of us would go water the plants at night, we noticed the strange sounds. I got a phone call from my son at two in the morning. He was very agitated. I figured something was very wrong. For two weeks, the family had been living in a state of stress and insomnia. Every other night, we'd drive to their land to water their cornfield. There were noises that we had never heard before. See, we didn't know what it was. We know there are animals out here, we know that. But this sound gave me goosebumps. It goes like a tapping sound as if somebody was chattering their teeth, only much more faster and louder, than silence, than shrieking. These aren't coyotes or wolves or anything like that. I saw something, and that is not from this land. That I'm sure. It was there standing before me as I pointed the flashlight at it. It was darn big. Then a sudden movement, fast as heck, and it was gone. I can only describe it as an eight-foot-tall winged creature with a long muzzle that resembled the face of an alligator. The animal was featherless and its skin was gray, with a wingspan of over 80 feet that looked like the wings of a bat. The almond-shaped eyes appeared red under the stream of light pointing at them, a known characteristic of certain rodents, opossums, and birds. The only creature that I can reference it to is a pterodactyle, even though I know that sounds crazy. Have you heard of other similar sightings in this area? I truly believe I was abducted by aliens a couple of months ago. My dreams of my house were too vivid to be dreams. Something happened. I remember standing at the patio door looking up. The ship was huge with two, three, or four big lights. I remember a red and white light. I knew I was looking at the back. But instead of seeing my backyard, there was a field with two cars. I think the one closest to me was a red convertible with the top down. There was a woman leaning against the car. I think she had dark curly hair. Darker than mine and softer curls. I think one or two men were sitting in the car drinking. These details are too vivid and too memorable to be a dream. The ship was a very strong material, gunmetal gray in color. From what I saw, the house blocked the rest of the ship. I was looking up. The clincher is that I was jolted awake in bed. I turned over and the clock read 526 of them. I felt like I had just gotten in bed and I was exhausted. I didn't want to have to get up and go to work. I turned on to my left side and my first thought was that I'd need to get checked out for any implants. 
I tried to find something on the internet to tell my story, but didn't find anything in that short time. I told my best friend last night, and she doesn't think I'm crazy. When I wrote it, I wrote things going on in my life before and after. There was no break. Also, I remember when I wrote this how calm I became. To clarify how I saw the ship, I have two sliding glass doors going outside. I have to open both of them. I remember seeing everything in the den as it is right now, not like a dream where everything is distorted or made up, and I was standing in the house at the first door, with both open in my, probably, nightgown that night. I was looking up, and if I had stepped out and jumped up, I could have touched the ship it was that close. I have metal awnings, but that night, it was like they were gone. Because the ship was so close, and the view I had, that's why I could only see the back. It was like I was being dropped off. I didn't feel strange or funny or have any weird things. Supernatural things do happen to me at night, but as long as I pray, it helps. I now wear a St. Michael the Archangel medal that was blessed by the Pope and pray to him each night also, and that has helped tremendously. To clarify being exhausted, have you ever gone out one night and partied and got drunk, not too drunk, but enough to know you're drunk and you came in at four or five or six of them? Then you throw yourself in bed and you're asleep before you've stopped moving. That's what I felt like. I had gone to bed the night before as usual, but when I was jolted awake, I looked at the clock see above and literally felt like I had been dropped into my bed and that I had not gotten any sleep. My best friend is the only one I told about this because I'm too scared to talk to anyone else. Maybe I watch too many TV shows and movies, but I have not spoken to anyone about this. I've thought long and hard and I wanted to report this, but I don't want anything bad to happen to me. It was a hot summer day and I decided to go for a hike on a trail I had heard about from some friends. They had mentioned that it was common for people to skinny dip at the end of the hike, and the idea of taking a refreshing dip in the cool stream sounded like the perfect way to unwind after a long hike. As I walked along the trail, I saw a few people sunbathing in the distance. Wanting some privacy, I decided to head upstream to find a more secluded spot. As I continued along the path, I noticed a lone man on the trail. I politely stepped off to let him pass assuming he would continue on his way. I finally found a quiet alcove where I felt comfortable enough to strip down and enjoy the cool water. I quickly undressed and submerged myself, feeling the refreshing sensation of the water against my skin. Just as I started to relax, I felt a sudden sense of unease. To my horror, the man from the trail reappeared, standing only a foot behind me, completely naked. He attempted to strike up a conversation, but my instincts were screaming at me that I was in danger. I muttered a response and quickly scrambled out of the water to get dressed. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, I began the three-mile hike back to my car at a rapid pace. With no cell service in the area, I knew I had to rely on my own instincts to keep myself safe. Every rustle in the bushes, every snapping twig, sent shivers down my spine as I hurried along the trail praying that I would make it back to my car without incident. When I finally reached my car, I breathed a sigh of relief, grateful to have escaped the situation unharmed. From that day on, I vowed never to hike alone again, always opting for the company of friends on my outdoor adventures. The memory of that terrifying encounter serves as a constant reminder to trust my instincts and always prioritize my safety. It was a quiet night as I drove down the narrow country road, taking my friend back to his village after a long day of hanging out. The clock in the car read just after midnight, and the only source of light came from the dim glow of the headlights cutting through the darkness. As we approached a small bridge, I noticed a peculiar sight, a small cloud-like formation slowly drifting across the road. Just a bit of fog, I thought to myself not an unusual occurrence on these country roads. My friend, lost in thought, was staring out the window, oblivious to the foggy apparition up ahead. As we got closer, I expected our car to pass through the fog, but what happened next left me baffled and frightened. Instead of us driving through the fog, 
The fog seemed to pass through the car itself. It seemed to defy the laws of nature as the misty cloud moved right between the two of us and out through the back of the car. Startled, I jumped in my seat, gripping the steering wheel tightly. My friend, who hadn't been paying attention to the road, was equally shocked by the phenomenon. He confirmed that he had also witnessed the fog passing through the car, leaving us both bewildered and struggling to make sense of what had just happened. We spent the rest of the drive discussing our eerie encounter, trying to come up with a rational explanation for the strange fog. But to this day, the experience remains unexplained, a chilling memory that lingers in our minds whenever we find ourselves driving down those lonely country roads late at night. As a kid, I dreamt of being an officer like my father and his dad before him. It kind of ran in the family. So every time I was sitting in the passenger seat of my partner's cop car, it was even more special. It was my very first night, and my partner kept joking on me, ripping on me, and calling me a rookie. But I didn't mind, I was very familiar with the hazing process. It was a boring night. My partner made attempts to break the silence by asking me all sorts of various questions. Other than that, it was silent, not much was happening. We looked around for somebody to apprehend, but to no avail so far. Not much of a first day. We kept on driving with nothing happening until I saw a figure standing on the corner. I told my partner, is that something there? I pointed to the figure that I can now see was a taller man standing with his head to the ground. She looked around for a bit before shaking her head and concluding it was probably just a homeless man. We drove off. I looked out the window as we passed. He turned his head and watched as we drove off. I thought it was weird, but not weird enough to get involved. We kept on driving when we got a call on the radio. 5 on 150 on South and Boulevard. My partner picked up the radio and told them we'd be on the way. I faintly remembered the 5 to 150 from training. It had something to do with the crazies. We took a turn to get there faster and in less time than I'd imagined, we pulled into the house and property they described over the radio. Loaded our weapons, exiting the car, I looked around again. A very quick scan of the neighborhood. That's when on the corner opposite of the one we had come in, I saw him again. The man from earlier, looking down at the floor. I tapped my partner and motioned towards him. She looked at him, and I can tell she was just as confused as I was. She whispered to me, you get in the house, I'll go talk to him. I nodded, heading into the house. It was huge, and to my knowledge, abandoned. Hello, it's the police. Is anybody there? Just then, from a heap on the floor, I heard somebody speak. You need to leave now. Go. It was coming from a man holding a wound on his side and bleeding badly. Sir, who did this to you? I asked, flashing the flashlight in his direction. Get out. Get your partner and get out of here before he gets mad, he said, fear audibly in his voice. Who gets here? I responded, hearing a little bit of fear in my own voice. He opened his mouth, but before he could speak, there was a gunshot that got both of our attention. I ran outside to see my partner now face down. The man she was talking to was nowhere to be found. I rushed out to her side, kneeling down beside her flipping her over before checking her pulse. I felt nothing. To show her respect, I closed her eyes before setting her back down. Unholstering my weapon, I walked back into the house aiming it. But to my surprise, the now bleeding man was not there. The house was empty, and his spot was a streak of blood heading out the back door, which I saw now had been busted open. I ran through looking around. There, at the corner of the fence, stood the tall man looking down. All right, you freak. Hands up. He didn't move. It's like my badge and gun meant nothing to him. He did not fear me. What are you hard of hearing, I said. Put your hands up, trying to make my voice sound more macho now. And that's how we're playing it, I said, fed up. One and two. Before I could get to three, he turned to me, looking at me. What I saw made me drop my weapon. His stare felt cold, but he could not be staring at me. There were two empty spots on his face where his eyes would usually go. 
I stumbled backwards into the house, nearly losing my balance but catching myself in the sink, vomiting a bit. I was still shaken up by everything that's happened. It all happened so quickly. I stood over the sink, waiting for the urge to vomit to make a reappearance, and I'd heard footsteps approaching. It was the man I saw before. He came in, wiping the blood from his shirt. He was not injured at all. I'm sorry, it was truly nothing personal, he claimed with a smug smirk on his face. You see, my boy has this craving for human flesh, and a boy's gotta eat. He continued to walk towards me. What is wrong with his eyes? I said frantically, considering I was more than likely going to die. He was born without them. Doctors can't explain it, but my boy didn't let it get him down. He doesn't need eyes. He goes by his hearing and his smell. He looked out the door, and here he comes now. I knew what was coming. Just thinking about that freakishly tall, eyeless man and my partner made me sick. I vomited all over the man and myself. He took a step back and called me a disgusting fool, explained to me there would be no mercy, and I ran as fast as I could, grabbing my radio and calling for backup immediately. I actually had to drive down the street to try and hide from this person until my backup arrived. He and his son were detained, and as it turns out, he had actually cut out his son's eyes as a part of some sort of sick, satanic, sadistic cult and fed him H flesh his entire life, treating him like a wild animal. As far as I know, him and his son are still serving time in prison. Nineteen forty two. My sister, Clara, and I were thrilled to be spending time with our family at Medivemps Lake. Our parents and uncles had taken us on a week long fishing trip, and we couldn't have been happier. The lake was a beautiful, serene escape from the world, and we eagerly embraced the opportunity to fish for Smallmouth Base from the rocky island near our campsite. Each evening, as the sun began to set, Clara and I would head out to the island with our fishing gear eagerly anticipating the catch we would bring back to our family. The island was a magical place, with its rugged rocks and the sound of water lapping against the shore. It was there that we felt closest to nature and the wonders it held. One night, as we sat on the rocks with our lines cast out into the water, we heard a strange howling noise echoing across the lake. It was unlike anything we had ever heard before a melodious singing from someone with a husky voice haunting and beautiful. Clara and I exchanged puzzled glances, unsure of what could be making such a sound. The singing continued for several minutes before it abruptly stopped, leaving us even more curious and a little unnerved. We decided to pack up our gear and head back to camp, eager to share our strange experience with our family. The following evening, Clara and I returned to the island, unable to resist the lure of the lake and the chance to catch more fish. As we sat on the rocks, the sun setting behind us, we once again heard the eerie singing. This time, however, we were not alone. From the shadows of the island's trees, two enormous, hair-covered giants emerged, their eyes fixed on us with an unsettling intensity. They stood at least eight feet tall, their bodies covered in thick, matted hair, and their faces a mix of human and animal features. Frozen with fear, we watched as the giants approached us, their hands outstretched towards our bucket of fish. Without a word, they took the fish, their eyes never leaving ours, and then disappeared back into the shadows from which they had come. Clara and I sat in stunned silence, our hearts pounding in our chests. What had we just witnessed? Were these creatures some sort of undiscovered species, or perhaps beings from another world? We couldn't begin to fathom the answers to our questions. We returned to our campsite, our story spilling out in a jumble of excited and frightened words. Our family listened with a mix of skepticism and concern, unsure of what to make of our tale. In the years that followed, the memory of that night remained etched in our minds, a reminder of the mysteries that still lurked in the world. Our encounter with the hair-covered giants would remain one of the most extraordinary experiences of our lives, a moment when the veil between the known and the unknown was briefly lifted revealing the incredible possibilities that lay beyond. 19.41 This took place last year at the beginning of summer. 
I was with my mom, headed down to my nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road, so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in passenger. It was around 11 p.m. and we're 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch of the road in a heavily wooded area, and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty good, but both me and my mom were able to get a good look at it and both agree on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person bigger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body, my mom's words, as if it were emaciated and its rib cage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell color, but my mom said she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see forehair. It had long limbs and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or horse would, with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be loping using its front limbs to pull itself along, and it was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, what the hell is that, as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life, it stood up and ran. Not like a dog rearing on its hind legs, it was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it had stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my nana about it to avoid scaring her which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock horses in the area around the time this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked, I don't think any died, but if I remember correctly there were a few horses that were severely wounded. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my personal experience. When my dad was a kid, he and my grandpa went to my grandpa's land to prepare the soil for planting crops. Bored, my dad wandered off to a nearby stream where he saw a bunch of human-like dolls playing around in the water. He said they looked like adults, only smaller. With proportions like dolls, not sure what exactly that means. They splashed around in the water, and at times it looked like they were even walking on it. They signaled at him to come and play with them, and my dad ran over excitedly. He said he played with them for a while when my grandpa noticed that he had wandered off and went to find him. When my grandpa found my dad seemingly playing alone by the stream, getting all wet, he got super mad and dragged him away. Apparently, my grandpa and grandma were never able to the duens whenever my dad would point them out. My dad still recalls looking back while my grandpa yanked him away and seeing the duens waving goodbye at him. After that, my dad started seeing the duens around the house. They'd pop out from behind walls during dinner, and my dad would try to feed them scraps of food, much to my grandparents' annoyance. Eventually, they got worried and took him to a local curandera. She did a little ritual and told him to keep a cigarette behind his ear for a week. And then, the duens were gone. He never saw them again. My dad swears it's all true, even though no one believes him, and he's embarrassed about even telling the story. The only reason he told me it was because my mom teased him about it the other day, and I forced it out of him. I love these kinds of stories and really wanted to share. If you have any Duen stories, please share. I'd love to hear them. My aunts and uncles say Duens aren't always so friendly, and told me some other creepy stories about them. My best friend Vinny and I were out riding our motor scooter on a beautiful sunny day. We had been coasting downhill when the road started to rise, so we kicked on the motor, 
approaching a level overlook area of a clear cut about the size of two football fields. Before us, at the far end of the field, down below near the trees, something astonishing caught our eyes. A massive creature arose from a fetal sleeping position. It was a Bigfoot. It looked straight at us before swiftly heading south with its arms swinging. As it passed a stump, it took one giant step up into the forest and disappeared from view. We almost fell off our scooter, scrambling to grab our camera and binoculars while trying to process what we had just witnessed. The creature was huge, with a flat face that clearly wasn't a gorilla. Vinny insisted that we explore the area, so we carefully walked down several feet of clear-cut debris to the spot where the Bigfoot had been sleeping. All we found were impressions where the creature had been lying down, but nothing else. We noticed that the stump it had passed was eight feet tall, and the creature had been chest high over it. The single step it took into the forest was at least three feet tall. We were both in awe and terrified at the same time. It was October 1993, and my cousin Jane and I were excited to embark on an elk hunting trip on Vinegar Hill. The area was known for its abundance of elk, and we were hoping to bag a big one. Little did we know that our hunting trip would turn into an unforgettable adventure. As we trekked along the creek, we came across a large muddy spot. To our surprise, we found five enormous Bigfoot tracks leading into the mud. Each track measured 20 inches long, and they were spaced far apart. Jane and I exchanged puzzled glances, wondering if what we were seeing was real. The following year, during elk bow hunting season, we found ourselves back in the same area. The memory of the Bigfoot tracks still fresh in our minds, we couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. As we hunted in the daylight around 2 p.m., we suddenly heard a loud, piercing eek sound echoing through the forest. Startled, we both dashed back to camp, our hearts pounding. At sunset, our friend Jeremy joined us at camp. As we discussed the day's events, Jeremy noticed movement by a bush and between three trees. He squinted, trying to make out what he was seeing. In the fading light, he saw a dark, shaded figure moving through the trees. It was tall, around six and a half to seven feet, and walked upright like a human. At first, Jeremy thought it might be his brother, but as the figure disappeared into the woods, he realized it was something else entirely. We couldn't help but think back to the Bigfoot tracks we had found the previous year. Could it be that we had just seen the elusive creature responsible for those massive footprints? We later learned that the area was honeycombed with mines, raising the question of whether these creatures used them as shelter. Though we never had another encounter with the mysterious figure, our elk hunting trips on Vinegar Hill would forever be tinted with a sense of wonder and curiosity about the legendary Bigfoot. While on a deer hunting trip, my father stopped the vehicle on the side of the road to have lunch. As myself and my three brothers ate, I noticed movement several hundred yards away out of my peripheral vision. I realized that something was up in a tree near the very top of a huge pine tree where the branches are just beginning to grow at the edge of the timber cutting area. The area had just recently been logged. I looked at it with binoculars and was frightened when I realized that it was not a bear but a huge man-like creature picking something from the treetop. I looked at it for several minutes. It was very dark brown and had its legs and at least one arm wrapped around the tree. It kept reaching up and grabbing stuff like it was collecting something. Then suddenly it turned to look in my direction when I saw the face very clearly. It had no hair near the eyes and nose which looked humanoid and definitely did not have a snout like a bear at all. Then it did a double look then realized that we were watching it, and without any notice just pushed itself away from the tree and free fell at least 60 feet to the ground with its feet and body staying in the prone position all the way. When it landed it made a very loud crashing sound into the freshly logged clear cut. My father screamed at us to hurry and get into the vehicle, and we drove away fast and he never talked about it to me again. My brothers did not see it because they were looking in the wrong direction with their binoculars. Very spooky, though. I had just finished a long walk through the forest. 
The smell of decomposing leaves filled the air, but suddenly I caught a whiff of something far more pungent. It was like a rotting animal carcass. As the smell intensified, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. As I walked down our dirt driveway, I heard a deep snort like a huffing noise. It reminded me of the sound a horse makes when it wants your attention. Intrigued, I looked around and saw a large male Bigfoot standing there, staring right at me. I was both fascinated and terrified at the same time. With my heart pounding, I took a cautious step, and to my amazement, the Bigfoot mirrored my movement. This continued for about five minutes, with the creature copying my every action. Feeling a mix of excitement and fear, I decided to run back to my house to grab a camera. As I fumbled to find my camera, I thought about the park ranger, who had been a friend and confidant for years. He had shared numerous stories about unusual sightings and unexplained phenomena in the forest. I couldn't wait to tell him about my encounter and show him the evidence. But when I finally stepped outside, camera in hand, the Bigfoot was gone. Disappointed but still eager to share my story, I went to the ranger station and relayed my experience to him. The park ranger listened intently, his eyes widening with each detail I shared. He told me that there had been other reports of similar encounters in the area, and my story only added to the growing mystery. Together, we went back to the spot where I had seen the Bigfoot, but there was no trace of the creature. The park ranger promised to keep an eye out for any future sightings and urged me to do the same. From that day on, every time I ventured into the forest, I couldn't help but hope for another chance encounter with the elusive Bigfoot. It was the end of August, a perfect time for a vacation, and I, Donald, had decided to indulge my hobby of prospecting for gold. So there I was on the Chetco River, about 18 miles northeast of Brookings, hoping to strike it rich. And guess what? I found a vein. But that's not the story I want to tell you. What happened next was far more exciting and much more terrifying. After a day of exploring the area, driving the dirt roads in my trusty old Jeep, I had decided to take a break. I parked the Jeep by the road to let the engine cool, the very dry and steep slope lined with thick brush just a few feet away. Visibility into the undergrowth was no more than 15 feet, but it was peaceful, serene. Then, without warning, the tranquility was shattered. Something charged at me through the brush. I couldn't see what it was, but I could hear it, a rustling sound that grew louder and closer. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. Whatever it was, it was lurking in the brush about 35 feet away. I could hear it moving, but I couldn't see it. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I felt a cold rush of adrenaline. Thoughts raced through my mind. Was it a bear? An elk? Or something else? I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread. I needed to protect myself. I rushed to the trunk of my Jeep and pulled out my magnum gun. I'm ready for you, I muttered, trying to sound braver than I felt. But nothing happened. Whatever it was, it didn't come any closer. The confrontation, if you can call it that, lasted about three to four minutes, but it felt like an eternity. Shaken by the experience, I decided to consult a local park ranger. A friend had introduced me to Ranger Ben, a grizzled veteran who knew the area like the back of his hand. We discussed the possibility of another animal bear, elk, or even a cougar. But Ben wasn't so sure. You know, he said, leaning back in his chair, there are stories around these parts. Stories about a creature living deep in the woods. Some call it Bigfoot. I scoffed at the idea. But deep down, the unease lingered. Was it possible? Had I had a confrontation with Bigfoot? I guess I'll never know. But one thing's for sure, that vacation was one I'll never forget. This incident happened back in 1995 when I was 15 years old. It was very horrible. I witnessed two guys that may have been like government agents or some other secretive governmental agents. They kidnapped my dad and left someone in his place that looked just like him. I later found out that the person left behind was a reptilian cloaked as a human. This person became rather rude to me as time went on. 
However, he talked with me, and he could even heal with his bare hands. He told me that we humans were looked down upon as sheep, etc. And he knew I had witnessed the two agents kidnapping my dad, and he said I was next. I became very scared. He had me taken to a place against my will, and met with what looked like a special forces group who forced me to sign paperwork against my will, and the guy who looked identical to my dad was standing there. I was spying on him one night and saw what looked like a snake's tongue come out of his mouth. I later discovered he was a reptilian. A very short human who looked like a midget was helping him. I think he was a gray cloaked human. I heard them talk in English, but then started talking in alien lingo which sounded kind of far eastern. Yes, I am here to tell you they can cloak and simulate our world undercover. My real dad, the one I saw whisked away, was retired military, and I often suspected him of doing something or being involved with the government or doing something secretive that may have led to all this happening to me. I also found implants that feel like something under my skin. One was an upside-down triangle or diamond shape. They also stabbed me and then heated me with their eyes, which left a very weird scar on my leg. I never told anyone as I was so scared of how these entities seemed to be able to operate with impunity and like nothing could stop them. They also conducted very horrible activities and what seemed like mental brainwashing experiments on me. After all these years, I'm still scared to this day. But I believe it was time to come forward. I just wonder what happened to my real dad. My family and I had decided to take a trip to New Orleans, the city of jazz, voodoo, and legends. We checked into an old, historic hotel in the heart of the city, excited to experience the unique atmosphere that surrounded us. One night, after a day of exploring the city, my dad and I settled into bed, the room enveloped in darkness. The only light seeping in was from the lamp post outside, casting eerie, dancing shadows on the walls. My dad was already sound asleep, his steady breathing a comforting presence in the room. I lay facing his back, my thoughts meandering through the events of the day. Restless, I rolled over to face the other side of the room. That's when I saw it a shadowy figure of a man wearing a hat and a long coat, clutching a briefcase. I strained my eyes, but his face remained indiscernible, as if he were an outline or a shadow, rather than a physical presence. He just stood there, still and silent, an eerie sentinel in the dark. Panic surged through me, and I wondered if I was experiencing sleep paralysis. But as I shifted my body, blinked my eyes, I realized I could still move. My heart raced, my mind grasping for an explanation. Was it a trick of the light, a figment of my imagination? The figure remained, an unwelcome intruder in the room. I never experienced anything like that again. But the memory of that night in New Orleans has lingered, a chilling reminder of the unknown. I've shared my story, curious to know if others have encountered something similar. What was it that I saw that night, a specter from the past or just a figment of my imagination? The answer remains shrouded in mystery. The day after my girlfriend and I saw the Mothman prophecies in the movie theater, we found ourselves driving up a road situated in the middle of Jefferson City, Missouri. The movie was still fresh in our minds, and we couldn't help but feel a bit on edge. As we made our way up the big hill on Southwest Boulevard, an unexpected event took place. Out of nowhere, a bird-like creature that bore an uncanny resemblance to the one from the movie suddenly bounced off my windshield. The impact startled both of us and I remember thinking that I had never seen anything quite like it before. Right when the creature hit my windshield, my girlfriend cried out, Whoa! The first thing that crossed my mind was how much it reminded me of the bird-like thing from the movie. Just as I was thinking that, my girlfriend said, that looked like the thing in the Mothman prophecies. Though it wasn't the seven-foot humanoid creature with red eyes and wings that the movie depicted, it still left us feeling uneasy. I couldn't bring myself to look back and see what happened to whatever it was that hit the windshield, nor did I have the nerve to stop and investigate. Maybe I was too freaked out, or perhaps I was worried about what I might find. To this day, I still wonder about that peculiar sighting in Jefferson City, Missouri. 
Whether it was a mere coincidence or something more inexplicable, the experience remains etched in my memory, serving as a reminder that there are still mysteries in this world that defy explanation. I have heard the story of the Quaker man who left Philadelphia to start a new life in the mountains of Pennsylvania. He was a man of strong faith, and after purchasing a large lot in Cook Township, he found employment at the Old South Mountain Iron Works. The land was perfect for him, with a stream full of brook trout, plentiful timber, and lots of open space to raise a family. He soon met a young woman and fell deeply in love with her. They were married by the local justice of the peace, despite the fact that she was not of the same religious faith as he was. However, they were happy together, and she soon became pregnant. In the final month of her pregnancy, the young wife began to experience bouts of anger and intense pain. The doctor could not diagnose the cause of her malady and ordered her to complete bed rest. The Quaker had a horrible dream that the devil had come to visit their home while he was at work. He was sure that his wife was possessed by a demonic being and that he needed to purge her of this evil. For 10 days straight, he knelt by her bedside, invoking prayers and charms, much to the chagrin of his wife. However, his wife soon became disgusted by the fuss her husband was making. In a fit of rage, she grabbed a small wooden cross and flung it out of the window. She declared that there was no God and that the devil was only a creation of a feeble mind. That very night, the Quaker's wife went into labor. She told in agony for the entire night and into the early morning. A midwife was quickly summoned for the delivery. Soon after daybreak, the child started its way into the world. As the midwife coaxed the new mother to push, it soon became apparent that this child was unlike any she had ever witnessed. The newborn boy resembled a beast, not a human. It was alive and breathing, but did not cry or make any sound. It was gray in color and had more scales than skin. It had a long tail and small horn buds above its pointed ears. There were claws for hands and hooves for feet. It also emitted a foul, lingering stench. This was the embodiment of Mephistopheles. The Quaker was horrified and could not believe that this was his child. He refused to even touch it. The midwife, who had seen many things in her time, was shocked and did not know what to do. The child lived for only a few minutes before passing away. The Quaker's wife died soon after giving birth. The Quaker was left alone with his thoughts and his beliefs. He eventually left the mountains and returned to Philadelphia, where he tried to reconcile his faith with the terrible thing that had happened to him. The story of the Quaker and his wife has been passed down through generations. Some say it was a curse, others say it was a punishment for the wife's blasphemy. But the truth remains a mystery lost to time and to the mountains of Pennsylvania. Okay, this happened a couple of years ago, before we turned 18 and before uni started. So we had a lot of spare time and nowhere to spend it. So my friends and I would often just walk around our town at night talking about random stuff. On the night in question, it was just me and one friend. And we were just walking without really paying attention to where we were going since we were in pretty deep conversation. We found ourselves walking towards an entrance to a footpath that's behind an estate. There's a fork in the path and going left will eventually take you to the high street and a train station. Going right will take you to some fields behind a cemetery. We went right, which sounds like a dumb idea, but it made sense at the time because you could get into the cemetery through the fields and then onto the estate where we lived by coming out of the cemetery. Initially, I didn't even want to go down the path in the first place, I'm scared of the dark and generally would rather not walk through a graveyard and a bunch of creepy forest baths at night. My friend reassured me though, and after all, it was the quickest way home. About five minutes in, the path leads through a small wooded area, and after that there is the gate that opens into the cemetery. It's really dark in this part, except for some distant lights from houses allowing you to see a little bit in front of you. That's when we saw a figure in the distance, walking towards us. From what I could make out, it just looked like one guy, probably a similar age to us because teens would often use this path to get from one estate to the other. I quietly told my friend that, and he agreed. 
We weren't worried because while there are some bad kids in our area, people don't really give you any trouble when they're on their own. As the person walked closer to us and us to them, I realized it was not a teenager, but a really tall man. Trying to calm myself, I remembered a tall guy I see a lot walking his dog, a big Alsatian. Yes, it must be him. I scanned the area for his dog, but I saw nothing. However, the man was holding something long in his hand. I thought it was a lead for his dog, but it wasn't flexible and in the dark and in my paranoid state, I thought it looked like the handle of an axe or a spade. My friend and I hadn't said a word since the man got close, but I just knew he was thinking the exact same thing as me. I didn't want the man to notice that I was staring at him, so I just looked down and walked as fast as I could without running. Thankfully, the gate was right there and once we got into the cemetery, we felt safe. Once we got out into the open, we started talking about what we saw and my friend agreed it looked like an axe or really big stick and said I was expecting to get a blow to the head as soon as we got near him. I babbled a bit, sorry, but I certainly stay away from dark paths now. Hello all. I wanted to share these two stories I have from my childhood that have always stuck with me and still creep me out to this day. Story 1. This story is short, but makes me feel uneasy nonetheless. I was in kindergarten as Mrs. Quigley's class. I loved her when she got a call from the office that someone was there to pick me up. I think this was before the time of like emergency contact forms with designated people to sign you out. Because this happened so long ago, I can't remember if there was a name given or not. But I do remember being five years old and not feeling right. I told Mrs. Quigley I didn't know that person and didn't want to go with them. She didn't make me and I rode the bus home as usual that day. I can't help but think that situation was something bad because I don't remember it ever being a problem that I didn't get picked up that day like it wasn't planned and it wasn't inconvenient that I didn't go with them. Story 2. My cousin and I were playing outside in a wooded area near her house and this wooded area was also next to a road. I just remember we were playing in there, then this pickup truck stopped on the road next to us. I don't remember what he said, I just remember taking off and my cousin tripping over a branch and falling. I was too scared to help her. Back when I was younger, around 12, 13, my three friends, and I also the same age, had a fort right at the tree line by some woods near our neighborhood. Right next to the tree line was a series of fields used for sports, so technically our fort was on that property and not the woods. Separating the woods from the fields was a large chain-link fence. One day after a large storm, one of the trees from our fort was knocked over. Leaning against the fence, naturally as kids, we thought that was awesome except for ruining part of the fort. We all climbed up on the tree, sat on it and whatnot. After some time, we were just sitting there having a conversation when I noticed one of my friends who was not on the tree was looking kind of past us on the other side of the fence. Uh, guys, he said in a shaky tone. We all turn around and on the other side of the fence about 20 feet away was an old man. He was dressed in tattered clothes, including a newsboy hat. He looked to be in his mid-50s to 60. He stood there smiling at us. I definitely sensed some malicious intent with him which is creepy in itself, but the part that gets me the most was how long he must have been there watching us, easily 15-20 minutes before my friend noticed. And what seemed like forever, none of us spoke and all we could do was stare back at him. My adrenaline kicked in and my reaction was to just run away, where my friends also followed. After a few minutes or so we gained the courage to go back, and when we did he was gone. It kind of scared us and we really never went back to that fort. Now the fence is replaced and the fort is gone, but my friends and I will never forget that creepy man. Today was just like any other day at work in the utility sector. As part of my job, I often find myself working on remote transmission lines ensuring that everything is functioning smoothly. As I made my way along the designated right-of-way, my attention was caught by a sign that stood tall on the edge of the woods. 
It had a stern warning written in bold letters, Don't enter the woods. It struck me as odd, as I hadn't seen such a sign before during my routine inspections. Curiosity sparked within me, but a sense of caution held me back from venturing into the dense thicket. Nevertheless, my eyes couldn't help but dart toward the mysterious woods, seeking answers to the questions that now lingered in my mind. And that's when I saw it a chilling sight that sent shivers down my spine. Nestled among the trees, a wooden structure stood ominously. It was a gallows, ancient and weathered. My heart skipped a beat as I gazed upon the gallows, realizing that it held two figures, or rather, lifeless dummies dressed in black attire. Their eerie presence, suspended from the gallows by rough-hewn ropes, sent a wave of unease through my body. It was as if time had frozen in this desolate spot, where darkness and mystery coalesced. My fiancé, Stasha, and I decided to make a quick stop at Hatchet Creek for some fishing while on our way back from Flag Mountain. It was our first time seeing this area in daylight, and we were eager to enjoy its natural beauty. As luck would have it, Stasha urgently needed to relieve herself, so she ventured about 25 yards to my right to find a suitable spot. She mentioned that she was also on her menstrual cycle, adding a peculiar detail to the unfolding events. After being away for about five minutes, a loud crack shattered the peaceful atmosphere. Stasha quickly recounted that the sound came from a big tree branch breaking, merely 20 feet away from her. It was an unusual occurrence since there was no wind to cause such disturbance, and none of the surrounding trees showed any signs of movement. Upon her return, we were astonished to witness a large tree being forcefully toppled no more than 35 yards in front of us. It was a sight that defied rational explanation. The timing and proximity of these events led us to wonder if Stasha's pheromones might have attracted an alpha male Bigfoot. As she continued fishing, I couldn't resist exploring the area further. To my astonishment, I stumbled upon what appeared to be a footprint that could only belong to a Bigfoot. Excitedly, I captured several photos as evidence. Intrigued, I decided to follow the creek bed to my left and soon discovered even more distinct footprints, including one that resembled a massive handprint. It was a chilling and exhilarating moment, as I had never before encountered footprints like the ones I found that day. Leaving the footprints behind temporarily, we hurriedly departed to gather some casting powder. Returning to the site around 5.45 p.m., we began the meticulous process of casting the footprints. We allowed the casting material to set undisturbed for at least an hour, as dusk gradually descended upon the landscape. It was then, in the vicinity of the fallen tree, that we were startled by a series of haunting vocalizations, a distinct hoo-hoo-ha sound that sent a shiver down our spines. Intrigued and captivated by these inexplicable occurrences, I found myself drawn back to the area on three separate occasions. During my first return visit, a close call shook us to the core when a rock narrowly missed striking the head of a colleague who accompanied me. Several months later, when we revisited the location, we were surprised to find a group of kids camping nearby. The night took an unexpected turn when one of the kids' fathers, overcome with fear, charged into the woods brandishing a shotgun in an attempt to confront whatever had terrified them. Finally, on our most recent visit, Stasha and I managed to capture unidentifiable figures on thermal imaging, further adding to the enigma that surrounded Hatchet Creek. These encounters have left an indelible mark on our lives, igniting a curiosity and fascination for the unknown. We continue to seek answers, yearning to unravel the mysteries that lie hidden within the depths of the wilderness, forever humbled by the untamed forces that coexist alongside us. This story begins on a cool summer night in the city of Issaquah, Washington in the year of 1989. I was a patrol sergeant, on night shift with a squad of four officers, the night had been uneventful until approximately 3 a.m. Myself and an officer I will identify as John responded to an alarm at a business located in an exclusive shopping area known as Gilman Village. 
It is made up of older homes and buildings that were moved into an area near Isakwa Creek connected by a wooden walkway. Gilman Village is a very popular shopping destination for tourists and locals alike. I as a police officer enjoyed walking through the complex while working night shift for the exercise and to window shop at the many interesting stores. Receiving alarms at the different businesses throughout Gilman was common and most of the time uneventful. But on this particular night, there was nothing common or uneventful about it. John and I responded to the alarm at a business, which was then called the Levy Coat Factory. We performed an outer perimeter check of the building and found it to be secure. Dispatch made phone contact with the owner who declined to respond to allow us to check the interior of the building. John and I returned to the parking lot located on the northwest side of the complex. This is the area where we had parked our patrol units. John and I stood outside and carried on a conversation in the dimly lit parking lot approximately 60 to 70 feet away from the buildings in that portion of the village. The buildings were to my left and to John's right. Both of us noticed an unusual movement near the eaves of one of the buildings. It was a ball of light about the size of a cantaloupe, moving slowly from left to right following the area just below the eaves. The light was very intense. We started the light until it disappeared around the south side of the building. Goosebumps prevailed. Officer John and I looked at each other eyes wide open, each asking at the same time, Did you see that? What we had seen was strange enough, but nothing compared to what we were about to witness. While we stood and talked about the strange event, our eyes were once again drawn to the northwest corner of the same building, only this time it was the lower corner. A perfect ball of very intense light approximately one foot off the ground floated around the corner. The ball was about four feet in diameter and once again a perfect sphere. The thing that made me speechless was what I had seen inside the sphere. Walking upright was, for the lack of any other word, a creature walking. The arms swung back and forth and the hands were turned with its fingers pointed to the rear. As the sphere progressed along the side of the building, it went behind bushes that grew in between the sphere and the parking lot. The light was visible through the openings of the bush, and it was very clear that it was not being projected. As I recall, at least a full three minutes passed before either John or I could speak. To put it lightly, we were terrorized by the unknown. This event changed the way I think and look at stories by others claiming encounters with the unknown. John and I never spoke about the event until 2010. I work supply in the Air Force, and we have a couple creepy stories about our warehouse that I always thought were just the other guys having fun. So one night I stayed up real late and decided to go sleep at the shop to catch a couple hours of sleep before work. I kept all the lights off and passed out in the office, and about an hour and I start to wake up to all these noises. Sounds like someone's running around the warehouse. So I look out the doorway and don't see anything, and all of a sudden there's a crash in the room next to mine. The chair was spinning and stopped perfectly facing the desk I was at, and all the computer screens turned on. I went outside and smoked till everyone else showed up lol. This happened four years ago around New Year's at my house. I live in a pretty wooded area of Maryland. I actually have a nice trail in my backyard that leads to a stream. I go down here a lot with friends, my dog, and even just by myself. I've never encountered another person along this stream any time I've been there. Because of this, I've always felt pretty at ease there, but still a bit cautious knowing my whole neighborhood could just as easily walk down their backyards and get to this stream, or people from the neighborhood against ours. On this day, we had some cousins over, I believe, to watch a Ravens game and just get together for the holidays. It was unusually warm for late December, probably around 50s, 60s. We all moved outside to supervise my little cousins throwing a football around, my mom suggested that I take my younger cousins down the trail to the stream to burn off some energy. Honestly, I didn't want to because I was so bloated from food, but I did. I herded four pubescent boys down the trail to the stream. 
and they kind of ran off ahead of me to climb on things and do whatever. I just hung behind to watch over them and make sure nobody did anything especially stupid while playing on my phone. I kind of got this weird feeling while I was down there and felt not at ease, almost like a premonition. I turned around to look behind me and scanned the woods. The first scan, everything was fine. Then I saw it. There was a dark figure in the distance that looked male, but I'm not entirely sure because of the distance, who was half behind a tree, almost as if he was hiding and peeking out at me. When I spotted him, rather than go back behind the tree, he stepped out and just stood beside the tree while I stared back. I had a really bad feeling and got the largest chill and immediately yelled for the boys to come back. They didn't listen to me at first, but I told them to get their asses back and didn't say why. Just started hauling ass up the trail and made it back safely to my house, where I told everyone about the encounter. I'm sure nothing bad would have happened if we had stayed down there, but I really didn't want to find out. The Martin family had downsized their lives. A workplace injury had devastated Eric, and Shelley had left her job to take care of her Who's Band. As a result, they were looking for a less expensive place to live. Shelley had found a beautiful, older farm in Palmyra that was just what they needed. It was surrounded by dense woods. Eric's family had always been hunters, and his fairly extensive collection of guns was a bone of contention with Shelley. With the help of Eric's son, Sean, Eric built a strongbox to hold the guns under lock and key in the barn. Eric and Shelley had a routine of evening coffee on the sheltered porch, provided it wasn't too cold out. One night, they noticed strange, pulsating lights down past the tree line. At first, Sean thought it was just a poacher with a flashlight, but something didn't seem right. Shelley thought it was unnatural. Eric and Sean headed out into the field to investigate. As they approached the woods, the lights went out. It was so quiet, the snap of a tree branch underfoot echoed. Eric sent Sean around with his flashlight off, hoping to catch any potential poacher unaware. Eric felt something far beyond any fear he'd ever felt hunting. All Eric and Sean found was each other, not even a track on the ground to give them a hint of what they'd seen. Chelsea's boyfriend Nathan came for a visit, and they decided to go for a walk in the woods with the dogs. The dogs ran out ahead of them, catching a scent. When Chelsea and Nathan caught up, the dogs were rooting around by a large hole in the ground. Nathan thought the overly round hole had been dug with care. Chelsea had a bad feeling about the whole thing and urged him to leave. Finally, he agreed. What had the dogs found? It was Memorial Day weekend, and Shelley was making the evening coffee. The dogs didn't want to go outside to their pen. Something wasn't right. Eric noticed that it was particularly quiet on that misty evening. When Eric heard an odd sound in the distance, he knew there was some sort of danger out there. Eric began to usher Shelley into the house. She protested, but when she heard some rustling in the distance, a compa nigh by five sets of eyes looking back at them. She realized the danger. They rushed into the house and locked the door. Eric knew it wasn't a bear, but it was huge and dangerous. The guns were in the barn, and Eric wasn't sure his family was safe in the house. Eric want Ed to get the guns, but Shelley told him to stay. She went up to Chelsea's room and woke her daughter. Chelsea was half awake when she looked out the window but laid back down and went back to sleep. All five of the creatures were still there. One stood on its hind legs and looked right at Shelley. Eric felt an instinct to protect his family. With the creatures in the distance, he thought that he might be able to get the family car backed up close enough to get them out. Even with his disability, Eric went outside. Shelley went through the house, closing the windows. She finally found the two hunting dogs hiding in a shadowed corner. If the dogs were scared, Shelley was concerned. When Eric reached the porch, he realized that he might have the distance to get there. It was going to be the longest 20 feet of his life. He started to slowly walk toward the car. When he finally reached it, grabbing the keys and trying to unlock the door, the motion sensor lights popped on. Eric was frightened 
and very vulnerably. Suddenly, he was face to face with one of the creatures. It tried to reach into the light, but something stopped it. It bolted off into the darkness. Eric made for the house as quickly as he could. They decided to call the police, hoping for someone else to drive in while they remained sheltered. The police didn't take them seriously, telling Shell Lay to close the windows and lock the doors. Nobody was coming. They were on their own. Shelley heard them approach. They were on the other side of the outside wall, and if they wanted in, they were going to get in. Her family was being held hostage in their own house by these creatures. They weren't able to get the guns. There weren't any police coming. What were they going to do? Grabbing every sharp implement they could find, Shelley went and woke Chelsea. They needed all hands awake and alert. They all went into the master bedroom and laid on top of the bed, armed, waiting on daylight to come. When they heard the creatures outside, they were petrified. The only thing between the Martins and the creatures was the bedroom window. When morning came, they could finally breathe a sigh of relief. The creatures were gone. Eric called Sean, who came over and helped look for tracks. The tracks they did find were huge, with enormous claws. They showed a creature who could walk on two feet. These creatures had been hunting, stalking. Were they werewolves? To this day, nobody knows. When I was 11 years old, I went camping with my dad and my stepmom in a small town in West Virginia called Barnum. The park we went camping in was called the Barnum Whitewater area. Anyways, there wasn't a place to shower and the bathrooms were just a hole in the ground and their errant words to describe how vile they were. Our cabin was nice and cozy and was maybe 20 feet away from the river. One night, we decided to leave the campground to grab some food because we had almost no food. So we went to get some food, it was really good lol. But anyways, we went back to the campground around 9, 30, 10 and decided to drive around, well, about one quarter of the way around. There was Essa girl randomly standing on the side of the road with what looked like a torch. We pulled up to ask her if she was okay, and she froze. We thought she was drunk and drove off. As we came back around about seven or eight dune buggies come around the corner, and you're not allowed to have those in that campground. We wear like whatever and went to the cabin. We saw that the screen to the window was pried open like someone tried to break into our cabin. We were debating on leaving and going back to where we live, New Jersey, when a guy comes up to us with that same girl we saw in the woods. He asked if we knew her because she was scaring him and his two kids. We said no and he walked off and the girl followed. We decided to get the hell out of there, and while we were packing inside, she comes up the driveway and sits down on the porch, and we tell her to get the hell off of the porch, and she starts crying and runs away. The final time we saw her, she came up the driveway and started calling my stepmom her mom and my dad her dad, and we had not a damn clue who the hell this girl was. I can't really remember much about her, but I know she was blonde and she was pretty tall. And finally, we left. Now we called the police, but they said they couldn't help us for two reasons. One, we had already left, and two, the cops are not active after midnight. What if someone's being attacked or threatened with a gun and is about to die or something? We were in shock, so we went back and drove the freaking four hours back to New Jersey where we live, and we didn't get home until like 4 a.m. In the hazy grip of a potent high, my friend and I decided it would be a thrilling idea to sprint through the dense woods. Our senses heightened and hearts racing. We laughed uncontrollably, unaware of the danger lurking in the shadows. Suddenly, as if conjured from the foliage itself, a man clad in complete hunting gear materialized before us. His cold eyes locked onto ours, and with a commanding voice, he uttered words that froze us in our tracks. You kids are in a hunting area. Git. Time seemed to stand still as we absorbed his chilling warning. The weight of the situation settled upon us, drowning out our intoxicated amusement. It was a wake-up call from the realm of darkness we had blindly ventured into. 
The hunter's stern demeanor and the menacing glint in his eyes left an indelible mark on our psyches. Not a hunter, but me and my friends were screwing around about a mile deep into the woods near my house, and we found a pink suitcase with a name tag on it. We looked the name up, and it was the name of a missing girl. Called the cops and handed it over, but they never found her. They searched all of the woods in the area after that, and still nothing came up other than her suitcase with some clothes and some toiletries. So me, my husband, my daughter seven, and niece eight came camping this weekend. We've camped at this place four times, never had any issues. Last night, we were setting up and about to start making dinner. This was about 8 p.m. when my daughter looks at me, looks behind me, looks back at me. I said, what? She said, look behind you. There is a little kid, couldn't be more than six years old, just standing there watching my daughter and niece play with a soccer ball. I figured he was here camping too and just interested in what they were doing. My daughter invites him to play and he runs back in the woods like he got scared. I didn't see him for about 15 minutes so I figured he went back to his campsite. Then he comes back and at this point it's dark outside so we asked where his parents were. He said he didn't have parents, so I'm like. Then my husband asked if he was camping here. He screamed at my husband. My parents are dead and am homeless, I sleep in the woods. I said, okay, well, that's not safe at all, buddy. I'm going to call somebody to help you, he said. Please call them, I don't have a family. So I start to call the non-emergency line. I gave him some food and a Gatorade and told him to hang out until help got here. Cops got there about 10 minutes later. They start trying to talk to him. He takes off running into the woods and yells that his brother will be back for us. Cops chased after him. No idea what happened after that, but I did not sleep a wink last night. It was the creepiest thing I've ever dealt with in my life. There's no houses within 10 miles of here. I'm so worried about him, but so creeped out about the brother thing. For the past three days, I've been hearing something screaming, help me, help me, arg, help me, on and off. Everything started the night after my fiance saw something unexplainably creepy at the skate park near the woods while walking the dogs. We were walking our two dogs and we planned to go down to the skate park to train the dogs some more in agility. The park is small, only consisting of about three medium ramps and one that barely reaches mid shin on myself. The skate park is down in a sort of valley, and we have to go down some steps to get to it, and is surrounded by woods on all sides. As I was about to suggest going down, I noticed my fiancé stood still staring into the skate park, while mid-panic attack and the dogs were in front of them staring on and off with the smaller one fixated and pulling. They said, someone's down there. But when I went to look, I didn't see anyone or anything down there, and it was dead quiet. No, there isn't. I looked and I can't see anyone. No, seriously, there are people down there. Looks like a cult or something. They said half joking and half panicked. We need to go home. I was confused and thought it was their mind playing tricks because it was dark and still wanted to go down like something was inviting me. That's what it felt like in hindsight. In the moment, something was making me feel annoyed and frustrated at not being able to go down there. No, come on, there's no one down there. It's okay, we can go and run with the dogs. No, no, I want to go home. Seriously, please, can we just go home? They mentioned they heard a scream coming from the woods, but again, I heard nothing. And the second time they heard it, they turned and walked off quickly and I followed. For the rest of the night, they were really uneasy to the point I was worried for them. They were drawing what they saw, trying to make sense of it, while struggling to make much sense themselves talking about demons, nuns, deer, goat skull-headed man, etc. It creeped me the F out, and I asked to drop the topic, but I knew something wasn't right. The next day was okay, taking the dogs for a walk the usual amount, feeling better about the whole situation. Then I heard something. The first time I heard it, it was around 3 a.m., and I heard what sounded like a drunk or heavily injured man screaming for help. Nothing specific 
Just help me, help me. Og, help me. And the occasional screaming. It circled our housing complex and got louder near the window right by our bed. I got up to look out of the window and I saw a figure. It looked like a man in a gray tracksuit with his hood up, and he was walking away from us about 200 meters, 300 meters from our window. Staggering, drunk, or injured, but seemingly unbothered. Still screaming, help me. The thing is, the screaming was completely emotionless and uninterested. It stopped shortly after I saw the figure. The second time was around 8 a.m. The next day, the same emotionless screaming circling the house that lasted for about five minutes before cutting off mid-scream. I chalked it up to just some drunk kid wanting to scare people or cause a scene. Or perhaps it was someone with mental health issues in an episode. I then heard it a few hours later as I left to walk the dogs coming from the forest that our front door overlooks. Still emotionless in the same words. Help me, help me, Og, help me. There were two men by the road fixing up their bikes and people on their balconies smoking, but no one seemed to hear what I was hearing. So I carried on ignoring it. It didn't stop for the ten minutes I was out there letting the dogs pee and poo, and carried on even as I entered the house. It eventually stopped and some family came to visit, but when I walked out the house to get a drink from the shop, I heard it start up again. It started the second I opened the door and didn't stop even as I was walking down the stairs to the shop, or as I came out of the shop and walked in the house. It carried on for about five minutes after I entered the house again, just repeatedly screaming, help me, help me, please, and screaming. Now my brain is repeating it like tinnitus, the same thing over and over again, while my head hurts more and more from the screaming. Help me, help me, please. Og, help me. The same order just over and over and over and over and over again. I'm getting a migraine while typing this because the screaming just won't stop and it's getting louder, and I don't know what it is or why it's happening or what could be doing it. Years ago, me and five other people were drinking in the forest preserve. All but one of us were young men. This spot of preserve was surrounded by busy streets and had a large field with a creek that ran through the middle. The north part had a small patch of trees. They were very dense. If you walked 10 feet in, you could not be seen from the street. We would park on residential streets and walk from the south and cross the creek. We felt like where we went into the trees, we could see any car or person coming way before they could see us. To the north was a busy intersection, a lot with a restaurant and large store, and a parking lot that is closed after sundown. There is nowhere to easily park to the north, cemetery to the east, and no parking to the west. There are some houses to the northeast and northwest. We are in the woods, drinking and being loud. The road noise covered us very well. At some point, one of us stops and is staring to the north. He whispers someone is there. All I can see is the silhouette of legs through the trees. Someone walked through the whole patch of trees from the north to us, maybe 10 feet into the woods on the south end of the trees. They are standing maybe 15 to 20 feet away. We didn't hear anything. Someone saw the silhouette when headlights hit the woods for a second. We are standing there, all of us quiet. The person is not moving. They are standing still in the trees. Fallen trees are blocking most of them, but I can still see legs. We start to argue whether or not it's even a person. Finally, my friend shouts, hello to the person. Not a sound or move. He starts to take a step and asks, do you know what time it is? The person finally moves. I can see them walking back to the north slowly and quietly. They don't say a word, and very quickly we can no longer see them. We ran out of the woods and regrouped on the tree line to the south. We ended up finishing our beers and left an hour later. We did not go back into the woods that night. We never saw a car leave the lot or side street. I always figured they had to have walked from somewhere not near the woods. I also wondered what they were doing that six people didn't scare them off. A couple of us are big guys. It was the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me. As my friends and I were driving back home from the prom, 
we found ourselves on a secluded country road, nestled amidst the Portland-Vancouver area. It was during this journey that I noticed something unsettling, something that sent a shiver down my spine. Glimpsing at one of the houses along that road, an inexplicable sense of unease washed over me. The feeling was so strong that I couldn't shake it off. Curiously, I observed that this eerie sensation seemed to permeate most of the houses lining that street, creating an atmosphere of dread and foreboding. Although none of us initially mentioned it, I eventually confided in one of my friends, a remarkably perceptive empath, who confirmed experiencing the same unsettling vibes. It was a relief to know that I wasn't alone in my apprehension. What struck me about these houses was their distinct appearance. They had a peculiar architectural style, characterized by front yards that seemed to extend inward, creating an enclosed atmosphere. All of them followed a ranch-style design, and their front yards boasted gardens adorned with numerous small pine trees. I couldn't pinpoint whether it was the house's appearance alone or something more intangible that triggered such a strong reaction within me. However, the moment we left that road, an overwhelming sense of relief washed over me, gradually dissipating the haunting feeling that had plagued us. Nonetheless, the events of that night linger in my mind, leaving me with questions that demand answers. I wonder if anyone else has had a similar experience in that area. Has this phenomenon been observed by others? I'm open to hearing theories and explanations that could shed light on what caused these unsettling vibes and the palpable sense of dread we encountered that night. Not police or military, but a firefighter I have too that I found creepy. The first was an old church that in the 70s a local business bought. They used it as file storage before the building was condemned for not being livable. We got called for a remote alarm through a security company. A pretty standard call. Anyways, on arrival, we did a 360 walk around. Couldn't see anything but found a few broken windows. So we make entry through the front and just walk around with just flashlights. The dust, decaying rooms and creaking of wood from other teens walking was unsettling. Then the audible alarm sounded. Just about jumped out of our skin. We find the panel shut it off and as we turn around, two cops are standing behind us. One surprised jump and hearty laugh later, and we were out having found nothing. The second was smoke in the building at a telecom relay house where they keep local servers for phone and internet. We were walking around, could smell electronics burning sea hazy smoke, but didn't find a fire. Additionally, the whole building had a very Stranger Things vibe that none of us could shake. During our two-month training stint at White Sands, New Mexico, my unit had an interesting experience that, while not particularly eerie, left us in awe. We were in the midst of a night range exercise, diligently shooting away, when suddenly it seemed as if someone had switched on a fairly bright light. Naturally, frustration arose among us because such brightness interferes with our night vision goggles and VGS. But then, out of nowhere, a tremendous clap of thunder resonated through the air, halting our shooting and capturing our attention. Every soldier directed their gaze upward, trying to comprehend what had just occurred. What we witnessed was nothing short of extraordinary. A colossal meteorite had streaked through the atmosphere, exploding into fragments that illuminated the night sky with a brilliance akin to daylight. In that moment, our frustration melted away, replaced by pure amazement and wonder. The entire area was bathed in an ethereal glow, courtesy of this celestial spectacle. It served as a reminder of the vastness and unpredictability of the universe, leaving an indelible mark on our memories. While it may not have been spooky, it was undoubtedly a breathtaking encounter with the grandeur of nature's cosmic dance. I always loved being up in the woods of Washington. The cold, frigid air cuts through my clothes and makes my bones cold. The kind of cold that makes your soul take a deep breath. I muster my strength upon a steep incline through these woods. I keep on telling myself, one more step is all I need. 
When you know you're in a tight spot, you always encourage, or for myself, I lie to myself. Helps keep me going. I turn around as I finally reach the campsite and welcome the achievement of life that I'm at. The sun is now going down and I pitch up my three-step pop-up tent. I begin to crawl into my half-made tent like a dog runs to its kennel after being awake all day. I take my baby wipes out and begin bird bathing myself. Even though I am freezing I know sweat is all over my body especially the amount of layers I wear currently. Jeans off, jacket off, sweater off, socks off, shorts off. I, I feel relaxed and refreshed cleaning myself off after this 8 hour trek through the woods of Mount St. Helens. I open my map and begin to chart my next destination in dreams of Mount Rainier after St. Helens. Crack, I pause and carefully peek out my tent liner. I don't see anyone or anything. I lay down enjoying the nature around me and begin to drift off. Crack, I sit up and open my liner and I see a face. A uh, heart pounding and this pale white man runs across my tent into the tree line. I begin looking through my bag to find bear mace and my camping axe. I clutch it with white knuckles as hard as I can and I step out my tent. I turn around and see a ring of men in black robes around my campsite staring at me. I run into my tent and phone for the park rangers. Rangers pick up and I scream. Help I'm being stalked there's dozens of people around me please get here as fast as possible. I stay in my tent staring at my phone with every minute passing by I become more fearful. Breathing speeding up with every breath anxiety shaking my body. All I hear is, who phoned for the rangers? I bolt out of my tent to see two rangers on four wheelers armed with hunting rifles. I look and no one is around us just me and the rangers. I hop on their four wheeler and one hour later I get returned to their office. I get handed a bulky camera and I cycle through the photos. Pictures of me throughout my hike were taken. Distant shots and pics of me even urinating outside. Till this day I don't go to the woods near Mount St. Helens. I'm a retired guy in his late 60s who lived in Upper Northeast Pennsylvania close to the New York border in an area known as the Endless Mountains near Forkston Mountain in Wyoming County. I've lived there for 25 years. I moved south in 2020. My property was too large for one guy to care for because I lived alone. These beings let me know their presence only two days after moving in. I bought my acreage in the 1980s and then built the house later. I lived on a dirt road and had two neighbors, one on each side of me, both a quarter mile away. There's a pond and swamp 200 yards down from the house, and on the other side of the pond is a small open area and the beginning of a rugged set of woods. There was a field on one side of the house and woods. Across the road was a small open area and a mile-long section of woods. That was their area, the Sasquatch people. Of course, make no mistake, this was the wilderness and I lived alone. So I really didn't want any interactions with them, although they tried really hard to have it with me. I saw all the different wildlife there, including a bear hybrid, wild dogs, and a puma which I had on trail cam three times. I also had a backyard sighting after a few years of living there. I was able to get an old jeep along with a tractor and brush cutter and proceeded to make jeep trails on over 200 acres. The trails went through the woods, fields and hills. It was not all my land but with the permission of the other landowners, I was able to make some awesome trails. My first suspicions of weird stuff going on were when trees started being pushed down across the trails in various places. But it wasn't one tree, it was multiple trees being pushed down in the same spot. They were live trees, not rotten ones. In one section of the trail over the years, it happened at least 10 to 12 times with a 20-foot section of trail, and it would happen from one day to the next, with no wind or storms. Fast forward to 2009 when my daughter and family flew in from Phoenix for a visit. Living in the desert, my grandson and granddaughter never saw the woods, so we wanted to hike into the woods about 100 yards down from the pond dam. My daughter was snapping pictures with a good quality digital camera while we descended down a ravine and we crossed over a small stream and up the other side. 
Suddenly, my seven-year-old grandson, who is autistic, took off through the woods running away from us. I go and chase him. Enclosed are photos related to our walk. The first photo she took was on our descent down the ravine. She never noticed a small forest being standing down by the stream until she looked closely at the photo a few months later. The little guy was about 50 to 60 yards down from us just next to the creek. He looks only to be about two and a half feet tall. He looks partially cloaked. The second photo of him is through a filter. The other photo shows why I think my grandson took off running. He must have sensed or seen the shadow being or a cloaked forest being and got scared. That is not a smudge in the camera. A few months after my daughter's visit, I was cruising the trail alongside those same woods, and as I was cruising by, I saw a partially cloaked being in the same woods. It was much larger than the one in the photo. It looked like it was gliding through the woods, not bobbing up and down like we do when we walk. It was large and dark. I retired in 2012, so I was spending all my time home and around the property. This is when all the crazy stuff started happening. In August 2012, I had a daylight UFO sighting through binoculars. It was in the evening after dinner, and I was in my off-roader cruising around the pond. I saw this very large, bright gold silent V-shaped craft in the sky. It was not a stealth jet or a triangular-shaped craft, but a V-shaped craft. I stopped the vehicle, grabbed my binoculars, and watched it until it went out of sight over the hill. A few days later, I found two barefoot prints down on the pond dam. No human in the right mind would walk in that area barefoot. I could not stop thinking about the UFO and the possible connection. I had thoughts that Sasquatch was a really intelligent being. About a week later, I would make two wood knocks for five straight evenings just after it turned dark. I would go out on the front porch and swing it two times on the porch posts. It echoed really well. There were no replies, but be careful what you wish for. That was the beginning for me. A few days later, I heard two knocks from the woods from across the dirt road. Then again the next day. That wasn't all that happened. I heard loud, bizarre screaming sounds twice during the day coming from those same woods. I was the only one around during the day because the neighbors worked. To confirm what I heard my friend's 90-year-old mother, who lived under a mile away, heard the same scream on the same day. My friend is aware of these beings also. He had a sighting on his property, and I heard of another sighting about half a mile away as well. I was friendly with one of my other neighbors, and he told me his sister was visiting for a week. While sitting on the back porch at night, she heard a very loud knock coming from the woods below the house. The next day I went outside and heard a tree crashing down in the woods. I also told my other neighbor about these beings because he had two young kids and to never let them out and about at night. He snickered a bit, but he knew I was serious and got the message. I also heard strange hoots coming from the woods across from me in the middle of the day. It was not an owl. It went on for at least 10 minutes. I knew it had to be them. One nice fall evening, I was watching TV in my living room with the front windows open. Suddenly, I heard very loud speaking coming from the woods across the road. It overpowered the TV sound. It was just garbled speech, and I couldn't understand a word. I jumped up and ran out onto the front porch, but saw nothing. It was all starting to creep me out, especially because I was living alone. I decided not to have interactions with them. I also had weird things going on in my house. I don't think it was a Sasquatch, I could be wrong. But it was frightening. One morning during the spring of 2013, I noticed two gifts left for me in the front yard. My daughter was also aware of some of the activities. She took a photo of a Sasquatch that was about 100 feet or so from where she was standing. There were so many unexplained things happening around there that I eventually decided to sell the property and move elsewhere. My daughter was also concerned for my safety. I may later go into detail with you about the other activity and things I witnessed. I had embarked on a camping expedition along the picturesque shoreline of Alaska as part of my field work. Although my intention was not hunting, 
The allure of the untamed wilderness and the serenity it offered drew me to this remote location. As the sun began to set, casting an amber hue across the rugged landscape, I settled into my campsite, ready to embrace the tranquility of the night. Fatigue gradually enveloped me, and I found myself drifting into a deep slumber. The rhythmic lullaby of the waves crashing against the shore served as a soothing backdrop, lulling me further into the realm of dreams. Unbeknownst to me, danger lurked in the darkness, silently awaiting its moment to disrupt the peaceful ambience. In the heart of the night, a sudden eruption shattered the tranquility. A deep, angry grunting sound reverberated through the stillness, tearing me from my sleep-induced bliss. Instinctively, my hand shot out, searching for the comforting familiarity of my bear spray, a vital companion in the untamed wilderness of Alaska. The adrenaline coursing through my veins drowned out the pounding of my heart as I raised my voice, bellowing, Hey bear! Yet, to my dismay, the menacing sound persisted, unyielding and relentless. Time seemed to stretch agonizingly as the grunts resonated with an air of hostility, hanging heavy in the nocturnal air. Dread clutched at my core, and the realization dawned upon me that this could be the end an encounter with a formidable predator that could shatter the tranquility of this night forever. Just as despair began to tighten its grip, a sudden disruption broke through the tumultuous symphony of grunts. A colossal splash echoed in the darkness, rippling across the surface of the water. The source of the mysterious growls was revealed a sea lion, its powerful presence cutting through the veil of fear that had enveloped me. Relief washed over me like a tidal wave, mingled with a tinge of embarrassment at my initial misinterpretation. The sea lion, perhaps startled by my presence or simply expressing its territorial nature, had unwittingly caused my heart to race and my thoughts to plunge into a state of panic. It was a powerful reminder of the untamed beauty and unpredictability of the natural world. As the sea lion's growls dissipated into the night, I was left with a newfound appreciation for the serenity that camping in Alaska offered, tinged with a lingering unease. The memory of that fateful night would forever be etched in my mind, a testament to the raw power and primal instincts that reside in even the most seemingly innocuous creatures of the wild. And as I lay there, with the echoes of the sea lion's growl fading into the distance, I silently vowed never to underestimate the symphony of nature again. I was turkey hunting, fall gobbler I think if I recall correctly. Anyway, I was walking to my spot in my orange and had just started to tuck it away for non-hunters, turkey can see color, so the regulation states that hunters need to wear 250 square inches of orange while moving, but you can take it off and just wear regular camo when you get to your spot. In my MNGMT zone, you just need to put some orange somewhere within 15-ish feet of you to let other hunters know you are in the area and to be vigilant. Anyway, I just finish up stowing my orange away and sit down and start using my call. I eventually hear something coming from a ways away, and it's calling back to me another hen. Boy turkey gobble, girl turkey make a squeaky chucking noise like, uick uick. As the sound gets closer, I start to think that it sounds too big to be a turkey. Maybe it's a small flock. I go to call again and a shot goes off far too close to me and I shit bricks. I had not seen anyone come in, nor had I seen any orange hanging in a tree to signify someone else was hunting there, so I thought I was pretty isolated. Another shot goes off closer and the chucking call starts back up. Now I'm certain of two things. One, there is no turkey they would have scattered if nearby because of the shots. Two, I have an idiot out here trying to stalk me thinking I am a turkey, and he's following my calls and shooting blind or seeing me move and assuming I'm a bird. Either way I'm shitting bricks. I decide to yell out, ho oh, but, I'm not a bird quit shooting, and another shot goes off. I'm terrified to so much as wiggle a finger at this point because I can't see this guy but I know he's shooting in my direction and trigger happy. I'm sitting there hollering that I'm a human and contemplating the idea of moving to grab my orange and wave it to signify to this guy that he's shooting at a person when a third shot goes off, and I actually hear the BBS hitting shit near me. 
I hit the deck and laid flat for like two hours, absolutely shitting myself until I was sure they were gone. For any non-hunters out there, this is a known issue within turkey hunting. Because you need to remove your visibility orange, and because you are calling as an attractant, some assholes will attempt to stalk what they think is a turkey and end up stalking another hunter, and in their idiot fervor, they shoot at the first thing that moves. Say another hunter itching their nose. A good number of people had died that way, and it made me swear off turkey hunting. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.